join the conversation by calling in and sharing your thoughts on Governor Brian's speech. Your voice matters, and we want to hear from you. Before we delve into our panel discussion, let's go back to St. Thomas where our cameras are on the grounds capturing a protest near the legislature aimed at catching the governor's attention. Dozens of United Steelworkers members have been rallying since 4.30 p.m. to demand fair treatment and job security for workers providing essential public services. For more, let's hear from USW District Director Dan Filippo. You know what? We'll get to Mr. Filippo in just a moment. We're going to line him up on St. Thomas. So let's go to the panel and get into the expectation for this evening's discussion. Let's start with former Senate President Usi Richards. What do you expect to hear from the governor this evening? I think the, the governor is in the position, and good evening to the fellow um, panelists, to have to provide a whole lot of answers. This is his um, sixth state of the territory address. There are a, a number of um, infrastructure concerns, a lot of concerns about our schools. There uh, have been a number of groundbreaking of a number of projects that um, have only broken grounds, <coughs> excuse me, since last year, <coughs> and none has actually materialized. And I think that is something that's very particularly um, important to the members of our community. Attorney St. John, your perspective on what you expect to hear this evening from the governor? Uh, I expect that the governor is going to address uh, the economy. Uh, as we all know, uh, we all feel the inflation has just wreaked havoc on our territory. The cost of goods has, has increased significantly which places a significant burden not only on the consumer, but actually on businesses who have to procure those goods. Uh, so I think the governor is going to come in right off the bat with a strong address on inflation uh, and as it relates to the economy. I also think that he's going to have to address education. We saw recent numbers showing uh, that our test scores uh, have, are, are, have missed the mark, so to speak. As a graduate of the public schools uh, who went on to law school, uh, we, we cannot sustain this virgin, these Virgin Islands without addressing education and, and instilling uh, the, the, the passion for, for academics. Uh, so I think he's going to come at the, the, uh, the economy, and I'm also looking forward to him talking about education as well. Attorney Henry, your thoughts on what you expect to hear from the governor this evening? Well, I, in, in line with the other panelists, I, would, I expect that the governor will definitely be talking about a recovery. It's been going on for, since 2017. And... I think the people of the Virgin Islands feel like they're not seeing much. What I would like to hear the governor also address is poverty in the Virgin Islands, the minimum wage that we're at. Um, over 24 states are looking to raise their minimum wage in 2024. And that's an indicator of how citizens are doing, how they're able to better contribute to the economy. So I'm hoping that the governor will touch on these really important issues, poverty and wages. Mr. Hodge, finally, your thoughts on what the governor should be presenting to the people this evening? Well, again, protocol being established with the panelists, and I welcome to everyone. Good evening. No, no surprise to anyone for me. I'd like to hear about the, the water and power authorities. I want to hear about energy, uh, what the plans are, how we're going to bridge the gap, move forward, get reliable and affordable energy to all consumers, not just those who can afford to pay, but especially to those who can least afford to pay. And then the water situation, particularly on St. Croix, that I, I, I like to hear some more about it because it's, it's kind of surprising to me what, I, what was learned and how it progressed as uh, is not what I knew the system to entail. So uh, I found a lot of the findings that were early on to be a little strange from my understanding of the system. So I'd like to hear more about that. Um, but definitely water and power, and then the secondary would be with the economy, uh, as my colleague said already. So the economy is, is quite important to all of us. Uh, we got to make sure that we all can have as much disposable income to, to utilize for the things that we need around our different households. Well, you've heard from our panel. Now let's take a moment to hear directly from residents. We recently hit the streets on St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix to ask residents about what they would like to hear from the governor during tonight's State of the Territory address. Here's what some of you said. I would really like to hear the governor talk about the roads, which is so bad, and paying the taxes. St. John, I was seeing to get left out. So I want to hear what you got in store for St. John this year. I would like for Governor Bryan to address in the state of the territory, the schools, 
um, and when is the deadline for the repairs? The water as well. We've been going through the issue with the copper. Was it the copper in our water? Yeah, that has been a big issue from a minute now, but I feel like it's been so heavy right now with the color changing that they made it known to us, but we've been known about that issue with the dirty water and parasites in the water and everything. I would like to hear the governor talk about the issues going on with WAPA as well as the issues with the land swap. Budgeting, I'm hoping that he talks about that. It's a big deal. I think the last time I looked, our payroll for the Virgin Islands is much higher than most of the states. So how do we consolidate jobs so that we do have money to cover things like infrastructure and roads and things like that? I'd like to see him address waste management in particular. Sewage is running over as recent as last week. I had merchants complain to me about it. Uh, that is something that, again, you know, it's our community. Homelessness in the Virgin Islands, addressing the issues with mental health concerns and all the homeless people around, especially homeless people around my age, especially. Just focus on putting more love into the island, period. I mean, the buildings. I mean, for the love of God, have some pride in the way we look. Put some paint, fix something. You know, don't just let it be broken down the way it looks right now all over the place. It's like, what is that? After seeing uh, what you heard from the men and women on the streets of the territory, um, specifically regarding the economy, which you brought up early, and you mentioned inflation, which you know consumers, businesses, and the government also experiences, you know, inflation in the process of doing business. What do you think about what our folks had to say? Man, there's so much that was discussed there. Uh, I, saw, I think I saw a former lieutenant governor on there talking about the sewage, uh, and, and, and knowing him, it probably he was probably referring to Christian said. Uh, there was an issue with sewage running um, and a lot of business owners were upset with this and felt like it, it really impeded their ability to do business. Um, that's something that I expected. Um, you know, there, there was mention of homelessness. There was mention of the roads. The roads are significant because, let me tell you, it's a safety issue, number one. I was driving uh, the other day. Somebody swerved to avoid a puddle, almost hit me. It's a safety issue. It's an economic issue because your car gets wrecked. It's very expensive to change the suspension and so on and so forth. And also it just kills your passion to go out. Sometimes you don't even feel like leaving the house because, you know, why don't I want to run all over these potholes? So there's so many issues there that all tie back in some way to the economy. And so it seems like that is reverbing, uh, reverberating through a lot of the comments that we just heard. Uzi, what did you think about what our men and women on the street had to say? The, the, the first impression I have um, reminds me of um, the, the definition of, um, of health care, a, a complete state of physical mental, social, and economic well-being. And um, throughout our entire territory, um, all of these particular um, adjectives that we use to describe um, what healthcare actually means to a community are being pointed out. And I think the, the, the important thing is that um, we have to, to find a way to, to bring some focus and prioritize the things that needs to be done within our central government. Uh, Hugo, as an experienced executive in the government of the Virgin Islands, I think uh, to something Attorney Henry said earlier, uh, people feel like they're not seeing the recovery. And I think recently, if you read the editorials in the Daily News asking about where did this $12 billion go, I think there was a little bit of politicizing in their messaging because we all know that there's not a pot of $12 billion sitting in a bank account that belongs to the government of the Virgin Islands. So to ask that question is kind of like nefarious a little bit, but we know their job is to sell papers. Talk to people, though, about processes and why some of the things that we expect to get done overnight don't happen overnight. Well, first of all, we're talking about the federal government, and there's a certain amount of bureaucracy that takes place. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. So we, we don't have the funds. We don't have the, the dollars in our... In our we, we have a lot of needs for services, but the tax base, where, which is where you pay for services, can't cover all the desired services much less the perception of services that people believe they should be receiving. Now, when we talk about the federal process, I can tell you that in the 2000s, I think around 2010 or 12, I was able to resolve the FEMA issues with Hurricane Hugo. That hit in 1989. That's how long some of these processes take to, to materialize and get to, to the end, end point. So I, 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 I'm happy that we have access to... 12, I'm hearing upwards of $15 billion, um, but I do understand what comes with it and, and the length of time some of it takes. Sometimes it's, it's getting your, your finances in order. They want to see current audits. 
Um, I'm hearing about audits that are three and four years late. We're not going to get federal funds until the audits are current. Um, if you couldn't get the audits done in one year, how can you promise me three in one year, right? So uh, it, it's certain things that have to take place that, that I expect to see uh, materialize over the next year or two. Um, but definitely the process is what it is, and it takes this kind of time because when you're holding the blade and not the handle, you have to make sure that all your ducks are in a row for them to provide the funding that you desire. Attorney Henry, recently the governor in one of his uh, weekly press conferences talked about the amount of cash on hand. Uh, in recent State of the Territory addresses, the governor has touted the uh, economy as one of the mainstays of his administration. The fact that they've been able to do significant belt tightening came on board with a certain number, I believe it was six days cash on hands, tripled it to 18 at one point in his administration, which was also mentioned in the State of the Territory. Recently, we heard the governor say, we got two, maybe three. Um, what do you, and, and then again, going to the legislature on Friday for the uh, line of credit. What do you think is happening with the economy? And is it a cash flow issue or do we have a management, a cash management issue? Well, I think, I think it's both, right? It's, it was clear from the legislative he, um, hearing that we have an issue with the governor's financial team really being able to pull together the central government to do what it needs to do. We have $72 million from the federal government but we are using the general fund to pay the federal government's payroll expenses. We're spending the general fund money, but not drawing down the federal government funding that has been sent to the territory to help the people. These processes that we're talking about, drawing funds, it's nothing new. It's like the bedrock of government. And for us to be telling the people of the Virgin Islands that we are now trying to figure this out. We have to have a meeting with the governor to understand how we're going to move forward. To me, that's very troubling, especially hearing it from the governor's chief financial people. Very troubling. Let's briefly revisit the governor's previous state of the territory addresses where the highlighted of the territory, where he highlighted, excuse me, the territory's economic progress, along with his recent thoughts from earlier this month. Tonight, as I begin now my fourth week in office, I must report that the state of our territory is distressed. I can confidently report this evening that the state of our territory is on the mend. We have maintained at least 30 days cash on hand for most of last year. We hope to finally say, gone are the days of measuring cash on one hand in the single digits. Over the last three years of this administration, we have seen the annual revenue collections exceed the revenue projections, creating budget surpluses that have not been seen in over 15 years. Four years ago, we promised to stabilize government finances, and we frankly outdid ourselves. We managed not only to stabilize the failing pension system, but we also realized economic growth during the global pandemic, while many other economies showed a decline. I want to take this opportunity to clarify some things about the current financial challenges our territory is facing, particularly regarding the timely payment to our government vendors. The government isn't broke. We have some cash flow problems. We have cash in different types of places, but we need the legislature's authorization to use that cash. So Could you say how many days cash on hand the government has? Three. If you ask me today, it don't look good at all. I'd say one, uh, but we're making up payroll. So we just uh, got payroll out. Oh, we're gonna get some vendor payments out this year, but we're down to like two, three days cash. Senator Richards, being the president of the legislature, you are very familiar with the government's budgetary processes and the finances of the government. Same question I asked Attorney Henry. Why do we find ourselves in the situation that we are now when we're supposed to have all this money available to us for this recovery process and to help us through to get this money into the economy where it's needed? My observation, <clears throat> what I think the, the, the current administration is um, suffering from is um, experienced individuals who are head of departments that understand the structure of um, central government. I've worked in, um, in the Department of Health 
uh, we have de dealt with um, federal funds for, for close to, um, to 20 years before being um, part of the legislature. I understand the, the subject matter of, um, raised by, um, by Mr. Hodge in regards to the expectation on how to disperse federal funds. And when I made mention of um, prioritization, um, a good example, if we, we, if we have 10 federal projects, and we, we, we're talking about um, the six state of the territory address, we're talking about at least um, going into um, a six-year six period, that um, we have 10 projects, we need to prioritize those that we can get done each year going down. We, we, there's no plan of action of how best to expend, to disperse, and to address the priority projects. And you can't do that if you haven't been able to prioritize what, where you want to go to projects that ought to be implemented. And I think this is what, what I expect to hear from the governor. And I believe in our previous administration, I'll take a, a quick example under the, um, the, the young um, Francis administration. They, they was, in fact, in government house, a capital projects coordinator, someone that spoke to the prioritization. This is what we would like to get done. As we speak today, we have an office of our disaster recovery but they are responsible for managing and ensuring that the federal funds get expended. And, and I think we, we need to have some real experience persons in government when we're dealing with implementation of these particular type of monies. Attorney St. John, you spoke earlier about getting the money into the economy and business owners taking the hit from inflation, et cetera. When we start to spend these monies, naturally that's what happens. Businesses get paid, taxes get paid. To what uh, Senator Richards just said about a plan of action. What would you take as your plan of action? What would you prioritize as the low-hanging fruit, per se, that the administration can take on first to get quick bursts of infusions of cash into the economy? Well, the first thing we, we need to do is make sure that uh, whatever money is spent is spent with local vendors. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion among local contractors about reforming our bonding system so that when money is spent, it's not sent to somebody in Louisiana who's going to take it and not pay any gross receipts, not pay any income taxes in the Virgin Islands, but they take their money right back to the state they come from. Um, so there needs to be some reform to make sure that whenever it's spent, it's spent with local businesses. So that's, that's the structural issue first that needs to be addressed. Second, we need to go into um, looking at the major projects, as, as, as my colleague just said, roads, easy. That's an easy fix. It gets people employed. It gets folks who are most vulnerable all the t often without a fancy degree or anything. It can get them uh, in construction uh, where they can work and provide for their family. Many of us know vendors uh, who have not been paid for periods of over a year and, and a lot of the young men especially are on the streets um, unemployed because vendors are not being paid. So I think we ought to start looking at the vendors, the critical vendors that perhaps employ the most people. We need to look at the areas that are quickest to mobilize such as roads, um, construction uh, projects, and get a couple off the road, off, uh, uh, off uh, going first. And then once those start going, the money starts being spent, it's going to be a cyclical effect to improve the economy generally. Hugo, as the governor's representative, I'm sure that you have reviewed prior speeches and know that there have been promises that the governor has made in previous state of the territory addresses. One of the things I think the governor's really good at is reminding us of the things that he said that he has accomplished. Let's go over some of those things that may come to mind just off the top of your head and what do you consider to be uh, crowning achievements, let's just call it that, of this administration. I think some of the things that have taken place are, are going to be on the financial and economic side. Uh, we can sit down and talk about um, what seems or appears to be easy to, to accomplish. We can talk about roads being a, one of those things. But when, when there's a budget of about $10 million in public works. We have $150 million worth of projects to do. And, and there's funding that's needed for, for those projects. So it's not an easy fix or an easy... Uh, thing to take care of. Uh, we had a water and power authority that was uh, being said by their, their current leader that he was in a position to have to raise rates uh, for, for an impoverished community. I saw the government spend just about a hundred million dollars on subsidies. WAPA's never had a subsidy ever before now. This administration came in, paid off the debt to WAPA, and then provided a hundred million dollar subsidy so that the, the residents weren't impacted by what WAPA was claiming was taking place in the economy as far as they're concerned. It could have been done in a prepayment. It could have been done where we're paying for future bills. It wasn't even done, in, it was done as a straight subsidy <laughs> benefit to ratepayers. No, no prepayment of, of bills coming up. 
And, and, and these are things that have to be noticed and, 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 and recognized for what it means to the economy or what it means to the ratepayers. Now, the difficult part is when you do make some corrections and the subsidy goes away, that's what you see. The subsidy go away. You don't see the rate reduction. So, I mean, there's, there's been a lot done on, or attempted on the energy side. I wait to hear more this evening. Um, I know um, some, of the, some of the capital projects, the school for St. John for sure, is a big accomplishment. Um, it's been a long time coming, and finally we are at the point right now where that can move forward. Okay, it looks like Senate President Novell Francis is uh, starting the official ceremonies that take place. As you know, this is a legislative process. But let's again revisit uh, Governor Bryan's previous state. Okay, I'm being told, actually, we see Senator Carla Joseph greeting Lieutenant Governor Tregenza Roach and escorting him into the chambers of the legislature. So our cameras are capturing both the activities inside and outside. We see Delegate Stacy Plaskett is being escorted into the well of the legislature by Senator Kenny Gittins. And traditionally, an officer, a member of the legislature will escort guests like our delegate, our governor and lieutenant governor into the well. And there is the traditional uh, shaking of hands, greetings. I was reviewing the COVID uh, speech, and it was interesting to see how we've gone from the fist bumps or the elbow bumps back to hugging and kissing. <laughs> but um, that's taking place right now. Um, the delegate, of course, looks lovely as usual. And uh, this is, uh, you know, we could consider a little bit of Virgin Islands pageantry. Every, I saw people in the cabinet today at hairdressers and people get suits and it's a dressy affair, but I think it represents the best of us and when we all come together. And I especially like to see um, our members of the judiciary and, and like tradition uh, dictates, they no normally don't, you know, clap or applaud any part of the speech. They're supposed to be the neutral branch. It's always interesting to see them just, you know, sitting there very stoic. But um, this, of course, is one of those moments where Virgin Islanders are paying attention. Thousands of us are probably glued to the television, and we thank you all for um, joining us this evening. Um, Attorney Henry, real quickly before we go back to the, the well of the legislature, um, Again, as an experienced executive in the government of the Virgin Islands and having ran, run departments, I want to ask you about the same question uh, that I did earlier. What are some of these things that are just not happening? And how do you think we can accelerate things, um, especially with the technology? I always look at technological solutions to things because when you lack manpower, resources, or finance, technology is usually that bridge that you can, um, you can get to solve issues. Where do you think, and are there any technological points or advantages that we may not be utilizing to help us with this process? Absolutely. Um, on the technology side, I remember when I was the commissioner, um, I fought really hard for us to replace the ERP system mm -hmm. with something that was much more conducive to assisting us with property management, dealing with our grants, Okay, we see uh, Governor Bryan being escorted by Senator Bryan as uh, Lieutenant Governor Tregenza Roach is, uh, Senator Blyden, Blyden, excuse me, uh, Senator Roach, uh, excuse me, former Lieutenant Governor Roach, excuse me, is uh, doing his round and shaking all the members as we see Senator Alma Francis Heiliger in a lovely outfit there as well. And he is about to take his seat. I don't have audio of what's taking place in the legislative hall right now, but traditionally the governor is accompanied by one of my favorite parts of the evening, the governor's own, written by our very own Alton Augustus Adam, the first black naval bandmaster, and I would consider one of the Virgin Islands' most accomplished musicians, a self-taught flautist like myself, but was capable of playing multiple instruments and a master at what he did. And uh, I enjoy hearing that recording of the governor's own being played. This is f actually one of the very few times that song gets to be played in a public venue. So um, a little Alton Augustus Adams usually accompanies the governor. It looks like the Sergeant of Arms is now announcing the governor's arrival. Welcome the governor, Albert Brand Jr. <laughs>
And we see the governor doing his rounds of uh, handshaking, and it's a very pleasant, uh, even for, for individuals that may have had legislative difference or legislative balance, everybody's nice at least um, for this moment. Senator Richards, you have experienced this moment a few times. So what is that normally like? Uh, well, you use the adjective nice. I just um, would, would like to call it very cordial. Ah, that's a nice that's I, I, a I think nice that um, in word. this particular setting, because um, after the, the governor, lieutenant governor, and the delegate have um, made it into the well, and everyone have heard the, the, the whether it's the anthems and the prayer, and, they, and they've taken the seat and they've heard the presentation. After the governor's presentation, there's a, a whole lot of um, different opinions of what the governor should have spoke about. And I, and I think, at least in my mind, and I never did um, like to, to hear um, members of a legislative body speak to the fact that the governor should have talked about this. Yes. Not what he should have talked about, Let's address the issues he did, yeah. that he did talk about. Okay, we're going to go to the remarks of uh, Senate President Reverend Novell Francis. Father Anthony Abraham of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church. Our scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 41, verses 10 and following. So do not fear, for I am with you. And do not be dismayed. So um, we're going to take I a little liberty and talk during a prayer. My grandmother will, will kill me for this part. But <laughs> we got the, the prayer going on. Back to what, what you were saying, <laughs> Senator. The other part of me is, um, there's nothing least acceptable than having dead air yes. when you're in yes. the media. So um, I, I have understanding of, of, of you needing us to at least continue to talk. And I'm willing to, to continue to listen to my fellow panelists on, on what they were saying. Now, I was simply making the, the sole point that um, the, the important thing for, for us to have some understanding is um, what the governor actually speaks about. Um, and if the governor and any governor have the ability to talk about everything that all of us want to hear about, I think we're we, we going to make it into the four-day morning. <laughs> uh, and that's and so, a great <laughs> point that you bring you know. up. Oftentimes on these panels, what he didn't say was um, mm -hmm. it gets mischaracterized, and a lot of people take liberty with that. Having oftentimes not been involved with what this process is like, and, and the process in writing a state of the territory usually is a year-long process because as you achieve things, as things happen in the economy, um, you are adding to the speech and building on it. And then, like Governor DeYoung did one year, we had the closing of Ovenza, which had him have to redo numbers, financial projections, change the speech <laughs> completely. Lieutenant Governor All right, it Trigenza looks like we're going to go directly to the well Senate again. President and we're expecting Novell Francis Jr. and members of the 35th Legislature. Chief Justice Reese Hodge and Justices of the Supreme Court of the Virgin Islands, Presiding Judge Deborah Watlington and the judges of the Superior Court of the Virgin Islands. Delegate to Congress Stacey Plaskett, Chief Judge Robert Malloy, and judges of the District Court of the Virgin Islands. Members of my cabinet and other agency heads, members of my staff, State Chair of the Democratic Party, Stedman Hodge, other invited guests, and my fellow Virgin Islanders. Good evening. <laughs> this evening, I'm grateful for the privilege of appearing before you again as Governor of the Virgin Islands of the United States to report on the state of the territory as mandated in the revised Organic Act of 1954. This is my sixth such address to the Senate, and I always look forward excitedly for the opportunity. However, as I look out at the audience, I'm reminded that we have lost some pillars of our community since I last addressed you. Even with my very own cabinet, I am missing the face of Darrell Mousy George, who stood unwaveringly with, unwaveringly with me and our administration throughout this journey. His absence here tonight is surely felt, as is the absence of the Honorable Alicia Chucky Hansen. She provided invaluable wisdom and experience as my political advisor and served this community with passion and love. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection for all those who we lost in 2023, but who have forever left their mark on us and these islands. Thank you. Please join me in honoring the service of the brave men and women of the Virgin Islands Army and Air National Guards. Last year marked the 50th year of federal recognition of the Army 
and National Guard. 50 years of excellence. I'm immensely proud of our soldiers and grateful for the redeployment of the Army Guard's 114th Aviation Detachment from the southern border of the United States, where they supported the Department of Homeland Security. We are also happy to have our Air Guard men and women home from the deployments in Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, and Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Our airmen and soldiers continue to demonstrate their competence and readiness, whether deployed within the Caribbean, activated during our local state of emergencies, or protecting the President of the United States. The contributions of our National Guard demonstrate to the rest of the nation and the world the high caliber of professionals that call the Virgin Islands home. As we embark on this blessed new year, the state of our territory is resolute. We are purposeful, determined, and steadfast. The social and economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic are increasingly further in the rearview mirror, and we remain firmly focused on the opportunity to permanently transform the Virgin Islands into a home that provides us all the standard of living and the quality of life we deserve. Hand in hand with you, we withstood the challenges and uncertainties of that time, but we have not been deterred from continuing to deliver on our promise of progress for the people of the Virgin Islands. That progress, that progress is most evident in the strength of our economy. Despite facing inflation, rising interest rates, and volatile global conditions, our economy continues to demonstrate resilience through sustained economic and job growth. While the growth of the last two years has been more modest than the years prior, the rebound from the COVID-19 pandemic has been remarkable. Consumer spending, tourism, and significant investments from businesses and the public sector have driven this incredible growth. GDP, According to the United States Bureau of Economic Analysis, the territory's gross domestic product, or GDP, in 2021 was valued at $4 billion, 2.8% higher in 21 than 20. This marked the strongest recovery and the fastest growth of all territories. While the final reports are not yet available, public sector, business investment, and the ongoing recovery in the tourism sector are projected to have generated more than 2% growth in the 2022 and 2023 years. Our employment numbers have improved. We have created 1,000 new jobs in 2023 alone. This 2.8% growth was mainly in the private sector, specifically in the hospitality industry, as that industry recovered from the pandemic and the 2017 storms. Other sectors in the economy remain relatively unchanged, demonstrating our consistent economic performance. Unemployment rates also remained low during this period. Last year, we realized a record low unemployment rate in the history of the U.S. Virgin Islands at 3.2% in the month of November, and averaged 3.5% throughout the year. This was lower than the national average of 3.64%. There is even more potential job growth if the restart of the refinery and other hospitality projects come online. So while recent indicators suggest some normalization is underway, the labor market is forecast to perform well, even as a post-COVID momentum eases. In fiscal year 2023, the value of building permits issued was $305 million, which indicates a 5% increase compared to $290 million in 2022 for the same period. During 2023, the private residential construction permits were worth $166 million, which is only slightly higher than the $165 million worth of permits issued in 2022. However, the non-residential construction permit showed significant growth, 200% increasing from $27.7 million in 22 to $83.5 million in 2023. However, if it feels like the economy has not been as prosperous as the economic indicators suggest, it is not your imagination. We have been battling the headwinds of inflation 
for at least the last three years. The positive impact of our economic, economic growth has been significantly tempered by high inflation. With steep increases in food, housing, and construction costs being the most significant concern. Now, I frequently go to the grocery stores in both districts and have witnessed a sticker shock on certain food items. The local consumer price index increased 8.6% in 21, and again by 9.8% for the 12 months ending December 2022. That means between January 21 and December 22, inflation in the Virgin Islands increased by a whopping 20%. This translates to Miss Mary's shopping cart, which cost her $100 in January 22, increasing to $120 by the end of last year. Now, while we got some relief from a decline in gasoline prices in the second half of 22, food and housing costs remain high, putting an incredible strain on our households. The good news is that the national inflation rate appears to be slowing down as the federal government policies start to take effect. However, the trade-off is that these policies have resulted in rising interest rates, which have, been, which have made credit and access to capital all more expensive for all Americans, including Virgin Islanders. But thankfully, the recession that was predicted in, by economists in 2023 never happened. And the national economy has remained steady. In fact, the stock markets finished this year at, at or near an all-time high. While higher interest rates and elevated inflation can be expected to weigh on economic activity in the near term, these factors have not altered the longer-term outlook for our economy. The Virgin Islands remains well positioned to navigate these challenges and is expected to experience continued economic growth in the coming years. Our economy now is indeed stronger than it was before the pandemic. That is undeniable economic progress. Now, tourism continues to thrive, with our cruise ship business standing out as the strongest in the Eastern Caribbean. In fiscal year 23, cruise passenger arrivals soared by an impressive 87% reaching almost 1.6 million compared to 851,000 in fiscal year 22. Surpassing pre-pandemic levels, the territory also saw a 36.5 increase in cruise ship visits, totaling 516 calls made in fiscal year 23. Notably, St. Croix, St. Croix experienced a remarkable 100% increase in cruise ship arrivals over the past year. In fiscal year 23, air arrivals ex experienced a 4.5% decrease to 756,000 from 792,000. Can't win them all. In the previous, uh, and although this is following a record high in surge in air arrivals, although the current figure is lower than the record set in 21, it still represents an improvement from pre-pandemic levels. This decline is attributed to the challenge of the air airline industry and what is faced recent, really for the last two years in building capacity to meet growing travel demand. And we all know the cost of the fares to come home have increased dramatically. We're in demand. We did, however, witness an increase in regional transportation options last year. Sky High Aviation started two weekly flights between St. Thomas and the Dominican Republic and once a week between the Dominican Republic and St. Croix. Cape Air began offering eight flights a week between St. Thomas and Nevis. Silver Airways resumed airlift connecting St. Croix and St. Thomas and continued flights between the Virgin Islands and San Juan. Fly the Whale finally provides daily flights between St. Croix and St. Thomas, a most welcome development after the challenges we, pay, we face post-COVID. I particularly want to thank Omar Ursula, the president of Fly the Whale, for working with us to provide affordable and comfortable inter-island travel for all of us. We, we expect much more announcements of continued progress in this regard soon. Right, Joe? 
Hotel occupancy rates in the territory remain stable at 58% in 23, a slight decrease from the 63% in fiscal year 22. This decline is attributed to the popularity of Airbnb accommodations due to the limited availability of traditional hotels, not a decrease in the number of overnight stays. Despite the shortage of hotel rooms, the number of visitors from the U.S. mainland that stayed for an average of three and a half nights significantly increased. In fiscal year 23, there were over 452,000 overnight vis visitors, an 85% increase when compared to fiscal year 22. Excitingly, the newly opened Westin Beach Resort and Spa at Frenchman's Reefs has significantly expanded our hotel inventory, contributing to the positive momentum in the tourism sector. The 392-room hotel plays a critical role for the entire territory by restoring our appeal as a convention destination. Right next door, the 92-room Morningstar Bowie House Beach Resort, part of the Marriott Autograph Collection brand, opened its doors in May. Together, both hotels represent $425 million worth of re redevelopment of Frenchman's Reef in St. Thomas, made possible by the incentives of the Hotel Development Act. I want to give thanks to Fortress Investment Group, the Economic Development Authority, the Public Finance Authority, Authority and this body for making this a reality. <laughs> On the western end of St. Thomas, the owners of By the Sea Resort at Botany Bay have made significant strides in developing that hotel, with construction of the first group of guest units well on the way. I was totally blown away to see the level of work and detail that the Ferrers have invested in this beautiful property. The Hampton in Haven Site Mall has also broken ground. The project is a five-story, 126-room hotel for business and leisure travelers. This property is expected to come, on, come online next year. It was a development that has come to fruition at a record pace, thanks to the GRS team and Sean Miller, who has made considerable investments in our territory's success. On St. Croix, the Carambola Beach Resort is gradually reclaiming its former prominence as a luxurious beachfront destination under new ownership. Carambola never really closed its doors, despite su sustaining major damage during the hurricane. Since then, the property has proudly presented itself with 150 renovated and upgraded rooms under the Marriott brand, finally. The Hibiscus Hotel on the north shore of St. Croix has entered the first phase of its redevelopment. I commend the Hamed family for making the investment to restore this property to its prior beauty. After 40 years, 40 years of un being unable to build a new hotel in this territory, construction and developments are underway. To keep these properties filled and the hoteliers happy, we must consistently market these islands to our potential guests. In this regard, the Department of Tourism continues to win industry accolades for its Naturally in Rhythm marketing campaign. The U.S. Virgin Islands was recognized in 2023 as a top travel destination, again, by prestigious publications like Condé Nast Travel, Travel and Leisure, Travel Magazine, and Farmers. Tourism remains the cornerstone of our economy, and we excel in managing it. <laughs> Fiscal year 2023 saw our streak of four consecutive years of general fund revenue growth come to an end. Gross revenue collections total a little over $942 million in fiscal year 23 compared to a record peak of almost $1.1 billion in fiscal year 22. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We collected $1.1 billion in fiscal year 22 in revenue. It remains the high watermark for revenue collection by the government of the Virgin Islands ever. It was a banner year. However, our collections were in line with our revenue projections for fiscal year 2023 revenues. Our office and management budget gross revenue was projected to approximately $934 million for fiscal year 23, and collections were off by less than 1%.
But this downturn in revenues is mostly attributed to the end of COVID-related fiscal stimulus re relief. This direct infusion of cash to the population included the Im Im impact stimulus payment. Y'all remember that? Stimulus pay. The increased child tax credits. The pandemic EBT transferred, all those nice food stamps. Premium pay. Everybody's knocking on my door for those. Water and power authority credits. Stipend for social recipients, rental assistance, mortgage assistance, and subsidies to taxi drivers, just to name some of the larger programs. These programs had greater than anticipated impact on the economic activity in the territory and helped generate substantial tax revenues for the government. Those stimuli have worked their way through the local economy, and now revenue collections are normalizing. Now, although the streak is broken, the revenues collected by this government remain far above where they were in the years before the pandemic. While the naysayers continue to predict fiscal calamity, our government's finances remain strong and steady. The numbers simply don't lie. The fact is revenues for the first quarter of the fiscal year 2024 are already above revenues for the same period in fiscal year 23. However, there is some cause for concern. The last six months have seen our expenditures outpace revenue collections. This has depleted our available cash on hand and caused significant delays in making vendor payments. Perhaps we could have predicted this. The government, just like everybody else, has been sub subject to the rising cost of goods and services resulting from the same inflation. This includes well-deserved salary increases that have been awarded to our public sector workers. We're not behind on any of those. Our available cash on hand has also been strained by aggressive efforts to stay on track with our commitments to pay income tax re refunds and retroactive wages. Simply put, we pay debts that are 40 years old with today's operating revenues all while continuing to build up cash reserves in our rainy day fund. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have a rainy day fund with 20 million in it. We anticipate that this is a temporary cash crunch and we remain on track to meet our projections for the collections of revenues in the current years. I, I want to assure our vendors this evening that we are working hard to catch up on outstanding payments and we will. That is currently the administration's highest priority. But in the interim, we have begun exploring options for establishing a line of credit for working capital. We look forward to further discussions with this body regarding the authorization to establish such a credit vehicle. The government depends on two big paydays each year, one in April when we get the taxes, and one in October when the late taxes come in. But all the expenses are incurred and paid constantly throughout the year. Now, while the present situation could benefit from the additional liquidity offered by a line of credit, having a general fund budget that is approaching one billion, I didn't say total, no, just a general fund, there's another 400 million in federal funds. Now having a general fund that approaching one billion dollars, it means that we have to develop a more permanent cash management strategy. To effectively manage government operation, it's time to join the modern financial world and establish a permanent revolving line of credit to bridge the gaps in revenue collections. Just like all of you in here and outside there, you have a credit card to get you from one payday to the next every two weeks. You need to buy something now. You expect the money to come in. My money don't come until April. <laughs> Give me a little credit. We are ready to have those conversations with this body. Perhaps the primary driver of our progress as a territory has been the unprecedented level of public infrastructure projects currently underway. The ongoing rehabilitation of Melvin Evans Highway has brought critical improvements to the entire corridor. This includes reconstruction of the stormwater drainage system, traffic and safety enhancements, such as street lights, guardrails, dedicated turning lanes, and roadway widening and repaving. Additionally, we have constructed an entire new Clifton Hill connector road and will be improving the adjacent container port road intersection to include dedicated turning lane. 
This entire project is a significant improvement for the safety of our motorists. And you can already see the progress. No more blind hills and hazardous conditions for our pedestrians. I am fully aware of the inadequate lighting situation on Melvin Evans Highway and the great safety concern it presents. But over the last decade, the lighting has deteriorated due to the theft of copper wires, hurricane damage, blown bulbs. Frankly, I can't remember the last time I saw that highway fully lit. However, under this administration, I am pleased to announce that at least 45% of the street light on the highway have already been restored or replaced, with the remainder expected to be completed this summer. <laughs> I know y'all think I travel different roads, but just like you, I frequently travel the same roads in the territory. I also hear constantly from other residents, including my own child in my house, who are affected by potholes and poor road conditions. Early upon become gov becoming governor, I recognized that the federal highway funds allotted to the territory were totally inadequate to address all our needs. That is why we have been dedicating increasing amounts of local funds to supplement these federal dollars. These last four years have seen millions upon millions of dollars invested in the territory's roadways. Even though last year's local funds for road work were not as substantial as previous years, we were still able to begin work on roads in Estate Wim and Mount Pleasant on St. Croix and in Estate Bolongo and Bovoni and St. Thomas. We have earmarked another five million this fiscal year for the Transportation Trust Fund, and we will use those funds to get back on, on track. Additionally, I'm extremely pleased to announce tonight that the long-awaited road rehabilitation project to the Ethel McIntosh Memorial Drive, also known as Mahogany Road, is now in, in the procurement stage, with an award announcement expected in the next few weeks. After almost 20 years, we're going to get this road paved, and we are all ecstatic to see this project finally happening. happening. <laughs> Similarly, similarly, the long-awaited FEMA-funded projects for roads have also continued. Residents can expect to see significant improvements in many areas across all four islands, with an emphasis on resilient and hardened infrastructure. On Water Island alone, over 60% of the roadways have been improved and rehabilitated. Roads in Francis Bay, Cruz Bay, Susannaburg, and Pastori have already been addressed on St. John. On St. Thomas, work has started at Cabrita Point and Botany Bay. Now, the FEMA process has been slow and painstaking, but it's paying dividends. Like elsewhere in the country, the historic bridges on St. Croix are starting to show their age and are in need of repair. Contracts have been awarded to the repair of five of those bridges. The temporary Altona Bridge was completed in the summer 2023 and is currently in use. The Altona Lagoon, Queen Mary Highway, East Airport Ridge, Projects are all in progress and are scheduled to be completed in the next few months. To maintain traffic flow, the Agriculture Road Bridge and the Midland Road Bridge will commence, will commence once the other projects are completed. Now our ports, just like our road infrastructure, are undergoing modernization and improvement. The Virgin Islands Port Authority is in the process of selecting a development partner to modernize and upgrade the Henry E. Rosen Airport on St. Croix and the Cyril E. King Airport on St. Thomas. In this latest endeavor, VIPA aims to use private investment to bring state-of-the-art amenities, efficient airport operations, and long-term maintenance plan to these two critical assets. Under the contemplated arrangement, the Port Authority will remain the owner of the airports and the recipient of any federal, gun, federal grant funds awarded to either airport. The selection has been narrowed to our four qualified firms responding to a request for qualifications. Final proposals are due in February, and the Port Authority expects to begin work on redeveloping the airport terminals by the first quarter of 2025. At the Cyril E. King Airport, the contractor is progressing on both phase one and phase two of the parking and transportation center project. VIPA anticipates that phase one of the project will be open for public, use, for public use by March. Completion of phase one will make half of the overall parking spaces available on the second and third floors of the garage. Phase two of the project is also expected to be completed within the year. In November, I signed into law Act 8787, 
which appropriated $17 million to the Port Authority for the dredging of the Charlotte Amali Harbor. This funding is necessary for the long overdue port maintenance to prevent potentially serious safety issues. The dredging of Charlotte Amali Harbor is vital to the United States Virgin Islands, maintaining its competitive advantage in the market for cruise passengers. It will allow ships as large as the Oasis class safe entry to berth at the West Indian Company dock in Haven site, thereby increasing passengers, cruise passengers, to the territory. I want to thank this body for working with me to get this $17 million approved. We, we have been in constant contact with the Army Corps of Engineers and expect we to get the permit by April. The Port Authority is prepared to put the project out to bid once the permits are approved with, January begin, with dredging beginning in January. Now, our cargo ports are also in the beginning stages of major expansion and redevelopment. We have partnered with Tropical Shipping and Crowley to successfully apply for $21.9 million from the U.S. Department of Transportation Maritime Administration, or MARAD, to reconstruct and modernize the cargo handling and storage infrastructure at the Crown Bay Terminal in St. Thomas. This project is now in design and permitting phase. But then in November, we were blessed again by MARAD as they announced another award of $22 million for the enhancement of the Wilfa, Wilfred Bomba Alec Port Transshipment Center on St. Croix, known to us familiarly as the Containers Port. As we speak, Executive Director Carlton Dow was out of the territory, solidifying our relationship with tropical shipping on these projects. I want to thank him and the dedicated staff of the Virgin Islands Port Authority for their work. <laughs> Last October, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, informed the government of the Virgin Islands that testing conducted a few weeks earlier had found alarming levels of lead and copper at several points in WAPA's water distribution system. Immediately, WAPA and the technical team at the Department of Planning and Natural Resources exercised all measures to find the reasoning and validity of these shocking results. Although WAPA has no, let me say, no lead service lines in its distribution system. Some samples were found to have exceeded the levels found in places that had lead service lines throughout the system. It is important to note that WAPA routinely tests its water distribution system for lead and copper using the testing protocols required by the same EPA. That testing had never produced results that suggested a system-wide problem with lead and copper. However, in the abundance of caution, we issued a no-drink advisory for the portable water system. To receive a federal declaration and access federal technical assistance, we ultimately declared a state of emergency. During that emergency declaration, the EPA began doing sequential testing that adhered to the established protocols for testing for lead and copper. This led to vastly different results that WAPA had previously observed and, sorry, this led to vastly different results that were more in line with the test results that WAPA had previously observed and confirmed. That lead and copper levels were below the levels that would be of cause for concern. It is our firm belief that the original round of testing conducted used incorrect methodology. The apparatus used to collect the samples at the meter box caused tiny shards of metal to become free and contaminate the samples that were sent off for, for testing. Plainly stated, the, water the way the water samples were collected created misleading results and led to the high levels of lead and copper reported. The proper testing methodology which took samples from the faucet inside the building without tampering with the plumbing components yielded way more accurate results. We allowed the local state of emergency to expire this past December, 60 days after it was declared, 
The National Emergency Declaration expires tomorrow. And we will also be rescinding the no drink advisory at that time. Now, while we do not be believe we have a water crisis caused by the presence of lead and copper in the water distribution system, I want to make sure you all hear, hear, hear what I just said. We do not believe that we have a water crisis caused by the lead and copper in the system. We do acknowledge that water in the parts of the distribution system on both islands are discolored and therefore unfit for consumption. It's been this way for the last 20 years. We have clearly heard the frustration of the residents who have to cope with brown water from their taps. It's simple. We are getting rusty water in areas where we have rusty pipes. But the solution is equally simple. WAPA must replace the rusty pipes. Now, WAPA has completed the Clifton Hill Waterline Rehabilitation Project on St. Croix. The rehabilitation of water lines in Estate Campo Rico is expected to be finished by March, and the replacement of water lines in Estate Hannah's Rest is expected to also start in March. A contract is in negotiation for water line extension and rehabilitation work on Northside Road, also expected to begin in 24. On St. Thomas, progress is be being made on water line extension and projects in Dunu, as well as Nazareth. These projects are part of a program of replacing aging and corroded metal pipes with PVC pipes. This started long before the state of the emergency was even declared on the water system. Several areas of the distribution system have been rehabilitated. However, we are hoping to greatly increase the speed of this system-wide rehabilitation. The FEMA has, was previously approved the replacement of the substandard sections of the underground water distribution system in St. Croix as part of the Hurricanes Irma and Maria disaster recovery effort. Last August, WAPA submitted a scope of projects with an estimated cost of approximately $1 billion for review by FEMA. We expect FEMA to provide a fixed cost offer to fund these projects later this year. A similar effort is being made to gain FEMA support for the replacement of substandard water lines in the St. Thomas as well as the St. John District. These projects represent several years of underground construction, and yes, the roads will be dug up once again. In the interim, WAPA has begun addressing rusty water in the distribution system by adjusting its corrosion control program. This entails inserting an FDA-approved food-grade additive to the water system that will essentially form a coating within the pipe that prevents further leaching of the rust into the water. This is EPA's strongest recommendation for water systems like ours that are showing signs of aging. For many years, WAPA had perfected such a corrosion treatment, but they did not make the required adjustment for the new water chemistry when the switch was made from desal water to reverse osmosis as a, as a means of water production. They are now working with subject matter experts to make the necessary corrections and treat the rusting pipes within the system. On the power side, the installation of the four new Wartzilla generators at the Randolph Harley Power Plant represents the project with the greatest potential to reduce costs for all of WAPA's ratepayers. These more efficient and reliable generators are now up and running on diesel, which reduces fuel consumption and lowers fuel costs. However, the full impact will come later this year when the infrastructure necessary for the generators to operate on propane is installed. The new generators will improve WAPA's reliability in the St. Thomas District by providing greater flexibility in responding to changes in WAPA's power generation. This will be solidified by the attached battery, battery energy storage systems, which will help buffer disruptions on the energy grid. This battery system, this brand new battery system, will provide nine megawatts of energy storage gathered during periods of low demand and released during peak demand. Improved operating costs on St. Thomas will accrue to the benefit of all WAPA customers territory wide. We are making progress in our efforts to buy out VTOL's interest in the propane terminals that supply fuel to WAPA's power generating facilities. WAPA entered into a contract with VTOL on April 20, 2023 for the acquisition of the terminals and associated infrastructure. And Act 8701 facilitated WAPA's ability to make a good faith payment to VTOL. Housing and Urban Development, HUD, 
agreed that Community Development Block Grant hazard mitigation funds could be used for acquiring the facilities. The application is now undergoing its final environmental review prior to the approval by HUD. We look forward to completing this transaction with the help of HUD and our other federal partners and resolving our obligations to VTOL by the end of the first quarter this year. My friends, I am fully committed to fixing WAPA and restoring its viability as a government agency. Most importantly, changing our perspective and approach to the energy challenges of this territory. It's essential. We are working very diligently to transform the future of energy in the U.S. Virgin Islands. In the years past, our economy and quality of life have been crippled by the oppressive costs of fuel for energy production. That is why we have invested over $100 million to subsidize the cost of energy to keep the rates from increasing for everybody. Our vision is to reduce the energy burden for all Virgin Islanders, which is at the core of a lot of our challenges. Residents and businesses must have affordable and resilient energy options. We are moving to a future where our power generation will be decentralized with greater reliance on small private power producers. We are also creating opportunities for individuals to produce their own power and purchase their own battery storage. Getting back on track with our renewable energy goals is a critical part of this administration's vision. To this end, last year, WAPA approved five power purchase agreements with VI Electron to supply the utility with 58 megawatts of solar power that will include Honeywell battery storage systems. VI Electron is in the process of developing solar-powered electric generating facilities, which they will own and operate on the islands of St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix. Construction has begun on the first of the two solar farms to be built on St. Croix and is expected to be ready to produce solar energy by April. Honeywell is a great example of the type of major multinational corporations that are willing to help with our infrastructure transformation efforts. Tonight, I want to recognize Christian Loranger of VI Electron and Lucien Boldea, President and CEO of Honeywell Industrial Automation. Gentlemen, please stand. Last year, the Public Service Commission also approved the power purchase agreement between WAPA and Advanced Power to provide wind energy on St. Thomas. The Bavoni Wind Project should provide more than 15 megawatts of wind power at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour, compared to the 43 cents we are paying now. Property leasing and permitting are underway, and the grid interconnection study is almost complete. Once the notice to proceed is issued by Advanced Power, construction is anticipated to be complete within six months. But the truly exciting opportunities to transform our energy infrastructure go way beyond WAPA. President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act allows the EPA to fund solar for all programs. These are nationwide. These programs aim to give subsidies and financial help to residential rooftop and residential serving community solar project projects benefiting low income and disadvantaged communities. We anticipate $100 million to be awarded to the U.S. Virgin Islands for this funding allocation. $100 million. This funding will allow the Energy Office to install photovoltaic or PV systems directly on low-income single-family homes at no cost to the homeowner. It will also allow solar developers to install large community renewable energy facilities or community solar that can provide electricity bill credits to low-income residents who are renters or whose rooftops are not suitable for installing solar. The Virgin Islands Energy Office is currently awaiting approval of this grant award, and we're assured that Uncle Joe is going to seek favor on us. <laughs> this funding will also support the continuation of the Sun, po Sol Sun Power Solar Loan Program. This program I told you about last year provides low-interest financing for homeowners who wish to install PV systems and battery storage devices in their homes, in which through paying their utility bill, they can simultaneously repay their loan. In addition to the anticipated Solar for All funding, the Energy Office has another $64 million in federal grants. That's to advance various energy in initiatives. $14 million has already been awarded. 
the considerable amount of funding being made available to the territory due to President Biden's climate change agenda will allow us to incentivize residential solar and energy efficient appliances and the adoption of electric vehicles. In addition, we have marked another $10 million of electrical grid grant funds for community focused projects. This grant must be in areas enhancing energy resilience, improving electrical power systems, or other innovative efforts that contribute to the electrical infrastructure. Small businesses with up to 100 employees, for-profit and non-profit groups, educational institutions, government bodies, and those working with low to moderate income or vulnerable populations can all benefit from this grant. These programs will bring us one step closer to witnessing the Brian Roach administration's vision of a transformed energy future in the Virgin Islands. We want the next generation of Virgin Islanders to view energy independence as an achievable and a normal way of life. WAPA will continue to play a critical role in that energy future. Its commercial, industrial, and government clientele will continue to require affordable and reliable power from the utility. WAPA will also play an important role as a supplemental source of energy that backstops the distributed energy connected to the grid. We have already begun the mission of ushering in an energy revolution with WAPA. We will lay a solid foundation this year to get us there. <laughs> Through tireless advocacy, the Office of Disaster Recovery has successfully increased the anticipated allocations for federal disaster recovery funding from $8 billion to $12 billion, with the potential to exceed $15 billion over the next few years. Of the approximately 1,500 FEMA public assistance projects, 1,500, only 54 remain to be obligated. This encompasses the more complex education, healthcare, and infrastructure projects. In 2023 alone, more than 2.6 billion more has been obligated, marking a 138% increase compared to the funds secured in 22. This brings the total amount of obligated funds to a little over 8.6 billion, with 3.1 billion of that already spent. Over the next year, the territory expects about 300 projects to enter various phases of construction, generating over 500 million in spending. Now that we have successfully convinced the federal government to obligate billions of dollars to aid in the territory's recovery, my administration is laser focused on spending those dollars and accelerating the rebuild efforts. Accordingly, I've looked at areas where realignment is necessary to meet this goal to propel the recovery forward. On November 20th, 2023, the Office of Disaster Recovery executed an agreement with the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority to manage CDBG DR, or Disaster Recovery Programs, and has already transitioned its staff from under the auspices of the Housing Finance Authority to ODR. This effort will allow the territory to accelerate the spending of HUD dollars, foster greater synergy across various projects, and boost the performance of housing programs and infrastructure, infrastructure projects that have fallen behind expectation. Specifically, this change has allowed us to adjust the strategy to the Envision program. Remember that? We got to get those houses built faster. But we can't do it alone. I want to thank the legislature for passing the authorization in Act 8701 to establish a line of credit to provide the funds needed to advance disaster-related recovery projects. Besides the $45 million loan to WAPA for acquiring the VTOL propane terminal, $16 million of the remaining 55 has been utilized to advance other recovery projects. As I said, the, Virgin, the government of the Virgin Islands has expended over $3 billion in disaster recovery funds since Hurricanes Irma and Maria stuck in 2017. That is an impressive and unprecedented average of $500 million in federal recovery dollars spent annually over the last six years. Prior to the hurricanes, we had never expended that much in contracts in a single year, not even half that much. At this pace, though, it will take us another 20 years to complete the recovery. And that simply ain't good enough. Our goal is to at least double this amount and expend 
$1 billion a year, solely in disaster recovery funds. But to get there, we cannot continue doing things the traditional way. Frankly, we don't have enough contractors. We don't have enough workers. We don't have enough materials. And we don't have enough housing. We need a significant paradigm shift. And as a result, we are embarking on a new initiative called Rebuild USVI. We are estimating the total cost of reconstruction for the hurricanes to ultimately approach $15 billion or more. $15 billion. That is a monumental task for any community to manage. But we only have a workforce of 41,000 people. Rebuild USVI is being developed to expedite the timeline for this massive reconstruction effort. As a core strategy, Rebuild USVI will group many of the top priority recovery projects into billion dollar bundles for procurement. This initiative has three major goals. One, to attract some of the largest general contractors in the nation who can secure the necessary performance bonds on projects and bring resources and people to the islands. Two, to systematically resolve the logistical challenges and supply chain issues that have driven up project costs, discouraged contractor interest, and slowed recovery efforts. And three, to solidify manpower and capacity issues by transforming our project management office into a super project management office to coordinate high priority recovery projects and be able to have the manpower to do so. Rebuild USVI supercharges the territory's disaster recovery to think outside the box and dispense with the bureaucracy that is simply inadequate for our progress. The success of this initiative will allow us to launch several of our largest recovery projects simultaneously and create an ecosystem of economic activity from the resulting construction boom. This is the way we facilitate the transformation of a resilient Virgin Islands. In our recovery, our parks are crucial to our successful recovery, as any other component of our infrastructure. Parks provide important venues for family-friendly entertainment that promotes physical health and social well-being for our entire community. Parks are where future stars learn their preferred sport and hone their skill. It is where future legends like Aaliyah Boston and Michelle Smith are born and their stories are told. Here is where multiple generations of Virgin Islanders can find a common joy. This is why we have given these facilities priority in the recovery. The Brian Roach administration is getting our people outside and back to the parks. <laughs> on St. Croix, we are concluding repairs to the hurricane damage on Renhold Jackson Park in Wim, Kramer's Park Beach, Rudy Krieger and Science Farm, and the Marley Beach Front in Frederickstead. On St. Thomas, repairs are nearing completion at Emile Griffith Park, Kerwin Terrace Ballpark, and Joseph Abain Ballpark in Frenchtown. In St. John, repairs have been completed to the Oval Brown Basketball Court and the Cruz Bay Tennis Court. A grant agreement, between, a grant agreement has been executed with the St. Thomas Cricket Association, providing $1.5 million for the development of a cricket pitch and associated facilities in, a, in a state Nazareth. We have issued them the first half a million, and the construction has already begin, begun. I am pleased to announce that the Clinton Phipps racetrack is, in fact, on track. <laughs> Southland, Southland Gaming has honored its commitments and fulfilled its obligation. I will be giving out the Governor's Cup at Carnival Races this year. Yeah. I want, to thank, I want to thank those legislators who took the stance to support rebuilding the Clinton Phipps racetrack, and also to the owner of South Bend Gaming, Mr. Robert Bobby Huckabee, their senior vice president, Mr. Shane Gaspard, and my good friend, Mr. Jane, Jason Charles, for bold leadership, because bold leadership is necessary for the progress, and that's what we have now. Now, I wish I could make a similar pronouncement for horse racing on the island of St. Croix. Although construction, I saw a crane out there moving around, has just begun, VIGS simply has not made the necessary progress to return horse racing to the big island. 
Now, my administration has taken every step necessary to bring relief to our horsemen and racing fans. We even went as far as giving and granting $5 million to VIGL towards the completion of the track. We have approved the necessary building permits and leases. We have given concession after concession. But yet, no substantial signs of progress. Tonight, I am publicly urging VIGL to make good on their commitment to this government, to our horse racing enthusiasts on St. Croix, and to the people of these Virgin Islands. There's simply no more concessions that can be granted. In pursuing excellence, setting goals is the foundation of personal and academic growth. The students of the Virgin Islands exemplify excellence as they strive for success. Attention to students' academic achievement and effective strategies to address learning lo loss resulting not only from the disruption of the 2017 hurricanes, but also the pandemic is imperative. However, these discussions cannot overshadow the very real concerns that our faculties and students face regarding the physical condition of our schools. You heard me say it before, the straightforward truth is the schools are just showing their age and they become harder and harder to maintain each year. I wish I could just magically provide brand new schools, but the real solutions require significantly more effort. That's why we stood up the new school advisory board to implement the educational facility master plan. Through their help, we are now having a clear strategy for the replacement or extensive renovation of all of our school campuses. Construction of the first FEMA funded replacement project, the new Arthur Richards K through eight school commenced in February, 2023, and is expected to be substantially completed by the spring of 26. The first phase of the Gladys Abraham modernization project was completed by custom builders in September 23. This will become the new site of the Wheatley Skills Center on St. Thomas. In September, solicitations were concluded, concluded for three additional school projects. The design services for St. Croix Central High School have been awarded to MCN Build, while design services for St. Thomas Charlotte Amali High School and the, the modernization of Bertha C. Bushelty Middle School have been awarded to the joint firm of Consigli Benton. All these projects are scheduled to begin in 24. Schematic designs are now being developed for Alexander Henderson Elementary School, Claudio Marco, St. Croix Educational Complex, the renovation of Lockhart Elementary, and Edith L. Williams Alternative Academy. Additionally, FEMA has also recently announced that they have obligated $133 million in federal grant funding for the rebuilding of the Julius Sprout School on St. John. <laughs> the acquisition of the 11-acre parcel in Estate Kathenberg from the National Park Service finally provides us with the perfect location for the construction of this modern-day campus. After 50 years. I acknowledge the, the frustration and concerns of those St. Jonians that believe that the National Park has not been a good neighbor and perhaps intruded on the quality of life of the native residents. I understand the concerns that St. Jonians have raised regarding unreasonable federal restrictions and in some cases, the unfair treatment by the National Park. These are issues that Trigenza and I have discussed directly with both present and former park superintendents of the superintendents, as well as two of the secretaries of the interior, both Deb Holland and Dave Bernard. Trigenza went personally with a team to see them. I assure you, we are committed for, to be advocates on behalf of the people of St. John. But I also listened very intently to the concerns of students and former students talking about their experiences and the hardships of attending high school as a resident of St. John. I have listened to them explain the extra effort and commitment that has been required of them over the years just to go to school. It is something that I believe we all agree needs to be addressed. It is unfair 
and it puts them at a disadvantage compared to their colleagues residing on St. Thomas and St. Croix. That is why we have moved resolutely and with intentionality to resolve the issue of public high school on the island of St. John. That is why we have fought. <laughs> that is why we have fought to secure the investment of 133 million that FEMA is willing to provide toward this effort. That is why I'm so grateful to the leadership of this body for passing the legislation that authorized us to close this transaction. I want to thank that you le legislators for that leadership immensely. <laughs> Together, we have written a momentous chapter in Virgin Islands history by reclaiming a critical piece of property from the National Park Service for the use and benefit of all Virgin Islanders. Not only will we get a new school, but a third of that property will be held by our territorial park system, and the balance will be used to educate the children of the Virgin Islands. This marks the largest public sector investment ever made on the island of St. John, a, north, a noteworthy accomplishment achieved. Together, I am thankful for your support, especially to Senate President Nobel Francis Jr. and Senator Angel Bocas Jr. for their incredible leadership. As controversial as it may have been in 2023, history will view this as a pivotal moment in the development of improved quality of life for all our people in St. John. <laughs> this year, will also find us making a fundamental shift in the structure of the Department of Education. We are on the verge of launching the Bureau of School Construction and Maintenance, led by an experienced and qualified facilities maintenance professional. This professional will also take responsibility for construction and major maintenance from the Department of Education. This is an initiative championed by Senator Donna Fred Gregory and passed by this body. We, we, we need, we must, we, we need to have our trained educators focus on student instruction, not building construction. The, the key determinant of success in everything we aspire to accomplish is a well-educated community. The Virgin Islands Department of Education is actively implementing its strategic plan to enhance public education. This plan focuses on four goals, all of them relating to student achievement. One ensuring we have quality schools. Two, fostering an effective education that produce self-sufficient adults. Three, engaging our families. And four, building a supportive community. Each of our schools have developed improvement plans detailing strategies to enhance students' performance with $250,000 allocated to each principle to facilitate that implement, implementation. That's a far cry from the $25,000 they used to get in the past. <laughs> School-based teams have now been charged with closing achievement gaps and improving student outcomes through redeployment redeploy of tools like iReady and Apps for Gaps. We are putting the power of change at the school-based school level. The administration, we remain focused on cradle to career. The Department of Education has put extreme focus on the foundational level of pre-kindergarten through third grade to ensure that students read proficiently. We encourage that the Smarter Balance Assessment data reveals that third graders have not shown regression in reading or math. Pre-K classes have been implemented in schools and those cohorts are being closely tracked. Moreover, the dropout rate has reduced, decreased from 4.9% in 2022 to 2.8 in 23, while graduation rates have actually improved from 74% to 78%. Plans are in place to ensure that every single 12th grade student has a goal for college, for technical school, military, or prepared to meet the workplace. Now, while we must focus our attention on the challenges confronting public education, there are always examples of great student achievement that continue to make us all proud. 
Last summer, 14 students received the opportunity to study pre-law, pre-med, and business at Harvard. Yes, Harvard University. William Mattia from Ivana Edora, Ken High School, won the best business plan in the business program. And Alandra James from Charlotte Mali High School won the best prosecuting attorney in the pre-law program at Harvard. 10 students attended Yale University's summer springboard travel high school program with Rodney Moorhead Jr. Down on the name? <laughs> from the St. Croix Educational Complex receiving the outstanding award for business. And Alary Monsanto receiving the award for emergency medicine. Jeremy Bello, the drum major at Alabama A&M and a graduate of our very own Ivana Edora Kent High School recently led the first HBCU school to participate in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in Manhattan. I, I ain't done yet. We're going to talk about the stars tonight. We're always talking about the bottom. At Ricardo Richards Elementary School, Ms. Allister's fifth grade scholars have been on an incredible journey of discovery by designing and building their own cars. Utilizing a systematic approach to design, these young minds are bursting with excitement and enthusiasm as they delve into the world of engineering. These are our children, and they are excelling everywhere. Throughout, throughout our public school system, you can find examples of talented and dedicated teachers producing exceptional scholars. This evening, we have two of the finest examples with us. Ms. Chevelle Simeon, an advanced placement English literature composition teacher at Charlotte Amali High School, who has been honored as St. Thomas St. John's Teacher of the Year. And Ms. Chiselle McConnell, a foreign language teacher and a department chair in the foreign language department at the St. Croix Complex High School, who has been recognized. Personally, I went to the class myself. You should have seen it. <laughs> As a teacher of the year from the St. Croix District, please join me in celebrating their awesome success educating our kids. Shut up, man. Shut up, man. I made sure I went this year to the classrooms. I didn't want it to be the first time I met them. <laughs> now, it's not always to do, easy to do the work that you do. And we all know that the conditions are real challenging. But our best and our brightest teachers persevere and find a way to be brilliant every day. We continue to invest in early childhood care and education. Projects under Head Start program backed by 42 million in disaster recovery grant are advance, advancing consistently. In 2023, six locations, Anna's Hope, Concordia, Bolongo, Limburg Bay, Mineta Mitchell, and Cruz Bay concluded solicitations with work commencing in August. Demolition is underway and completed for most of these facilities with contractors working to complete construction of six brand new head starts this year. Yeah. Y'all think that know me going on, eh? <laughs> a large part of our continued strategy to ensure that our graduates are both college and career ready is the Jobs for America's graduate program. JAG is a national nonprofit that deploys a model in 40 states, 40 states, designed to keep young people in school through graduation and improve their success in education and career. As a vice chair, as a national board of directors, I am extremely proud of this program and the success that they have across the territory and nationwide. We now have eight programs, having doubled in size under my administration. The Leadership Development Conference saw the participation of 186 students. 120 seniors will participate in a paid 12-week work-based learning partnership with the Department of Labor. The Virgin Islands has received awards for its outstanding performance for two consecutive years highlighting the significance of investing in our students for the future. That is what we did when we started the GVI Financial Fellows Program. We offered young people just out of college the opportunity to gain real-world experience with a big, big paycheck, $55,000 a year. This is a paid two-year internship in the government of the Virgin Islands. The first cohort of students graduated last year. 
and numerous of these graduates of the program are already finding success in permanent jobs. Young people like Department of Human Services financial analyst Robert Tirado and Office of Disaster Recovery financial analyst Lenique Williams. Stand up, let them see who you are. You're young people. <laughs> you have to invest to get returns. After years of people complaining about the drain brain, you see our young people shining. We want to ensure that our students receive a strong start from birth all the way through their public education journey and ready for the world. If there's one thing I am passionate about, you know is reading. In 2024, we, we began a campaign to bring our library, library facilities back online. We will continue to champion programs to promote liter literacy, provide flexible spaces for community engagement, and bridge the div digital di divide by providing easy access to online resources. Getting so excited. Our goal is for like all library facilities to operate at extended hours and weekends. I'm pleased to announce this evening that after receiving 1.8 million in extensive repairs and hazard mitigation measures, the Florence Williams Library in Christian said is reopening in February. <laughs> To add, the Athlete McFarlane Peterson Library in Frederickstead will be open at the end of this year. On St. John, we saw the hiring of new staff and the opening of the Elaine Ion Sprout Public Library. The Turnbull Library closed in August to undergo extensive renovation work, but it too will be open later this year. Now, I had the pleasure of dining with the auction winner in support of St. Croix's Children's Museum this past December. And I was sitting there doing our dinner. I was introduced to DPNR's newest initiative, and it's called Hoopla. Hoopla is set to launch next month grandly. What is Hoopla? It hopes to bridge the digital divide by putting our Virgin Islands public library at the fingertips of every Virgin Islands student and adult. With just a library card, everyone will have access to borrow and enjoy audiobooks, e-books, comics, movies, and so much more and all you will need to access this platform is a screen for free. Tonight, it pleases me to say that as of March of last year, the JFL North Temporary Hospital facility opened on St. Croix. This state-of-art $130 million facility accommodates St. Croix's residents during demolition and reconstruction of the Governor Juan F. Louis Hospital. Currently, there's still four additional projects necessary for the complete decommissioning of the former hospital. Once completed, the demolition of, existing storm dam of the existing storm damage structure can begin. This past May, FEMA announced that they have allocated over $800 million towards the new permanent facility. The Department of Health is currently managing more than $300 million in disaster recovery projects. These were awarded for the rebuilding of four different facilities, the women, infant, and children Center at Nude Handsome, which we, is complete. The Wick Building in Frederickstead, which is under construction. The Charles Howard Memorial Complex, which is going through demolition. And the El Eldra Shelterman Mental Health Facility on St. Thomas, which is in design. We are eager to start serving our residents in these new and modern health spaces. In 2023, after a successful battle with COVID-19, with more than 56,000 Virgin Islanders immunized and minimal loss of life, we transitioned from pandemic to endemic. However, COVID's impact exposed long-standing health disparities, emphasizing the urgent need to fundamentally change the way health programs are delivered. The future of public health is centered on health equity, predicting and preventing illnesses at the community level, lessens the disease severity that will serve to reduce the economic burden of our health care, most namely the unfunded care at the hospitals. The pandemic also pushed us into the digital age with public health increasingly dependent on automation and integrated systems for comprehensive program and service delivery. Today, the Department of Health and our Office of Health Information Technology are actively reimagining the public health landscape in the territory. We are making progress in making healthcare more accessible to our residents. For the first time in decades, residents in the territory have access to individual health plans from the newly admitted insurance carrier, Caribbean Group. 
This means an individual without belonging to an employer's group plan can get insurance. This insurer will offer individual private medical care, medical care insurance coverage, filling the long-standing void in the health insurance market. We are excited about the potential for this development to reduce the uninsured population. Lieutenant Governor Tregenza Roach and his staff have done an excellent work in searching for this opportunity for us. The country, the country continues to grapple with a mental health crisis exacerbated by the isolation, fears, and uncertainties resulting from the pandemic. This crisis affects us all, all our generations, but has been especially devastating to our young people. Last year, the Department of Health stepped up its effort to address mental health concerns in the territory. DOH held its annual Children's Mental Health Summit territory-wide to engage stakeholders in developing solutions. The Behavioral Health Clinic saw 790 patients and made school presentations to more than 3,800 students across the territory. Overall, our behavioral health outreach efforts have touched over 23,000 individuals as of November 2023. Last July, the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline launched 988 as nationwide Easy to remember the three-digit dialing code for people in crisis. The Department of Health has implemented the 988 lifeline. 664 contacts were made to the line from Virgin Islanders between January and November alone. The lifeline connects those experiencing a suicidal crisis or mental health-related distress to confidential emotional support from the counselors. The goal this year is to hire interventionists to allow for local answering of the lifeline. If the 664 contacts made to, this number past, made to this number this past year do not alarm you, then the four confirmed suicides we had last year should. Never before we've seen this in the territory. But perhaps the greatest public health challenge facing our community is the persistent epidemic of gun violence. Tonight, we honor the memory of Detective Delbert Phipps Jr., who was killed in the line of duty on July 4th. Last year, we revere his selfless sacrifice and dedication to the service and his service to this community. Likewise, we commend all those men and women who have chosen a career in law enforcement and conduct themselves with competence and professionalism. Last year, we added another 37 offers to their rank. We are grateful for your heroism as you keep the peace and protect our community. Gun violence. Gun violence is the leading cause of premature death in the U.S. for African Americans between the ages of 15 and 24. We are witnessing individuals in our community with a complete inability to control their anger or to resolve conflicts with civility. It is an urgent behavioral health, behavioral health concern for predominantly brown and black communities like ours. We understand the trauma and the fear and anxiety that many of our residents live with because of violent crime. We have heard the community cries for more prevention programs and work support for our young people. Our focus has been proactively intervening in the lives of people who are, the, who are most at risk of being either the perpetrators or the victims of violent crime. The Office of Gun Violence Prevention has taken on the challenge of addressing the root causes of gun violence in our communities. This work involves Planting the seeds to facilitate the long-term reduction of violence by mentoring at-risk youth, conducting community activities, making presentations in our schools, and assisting individuals with getting gainful employment and getting their lives on track. The office maximizes its effectiveness through partnerships with Project Safe Neighborhoods, the National Network for Safer Communities, various government departments, and others. In the short term, the Office of Gun Violence Prevention conducts walk and talks on the turfs, assist parents with unruly children, and intervenes in, inter in incidents to prevent retaliation. This past year alone, 
the Office of Gun Violence intervened in at least six potential retaliatory attacks that could have led to further violence and potential homicides. They have de-escalated numerous conflicts and prevented them from coming to violent conclusions. It is always difficult to quantify the bad things that didn't happen. But if even one homicide was presented, isn't it worthy of our acknowledgement and our support? <laughs> our Virgin Islands Police Department has been making substantial strides in its crime-fighting capacity. Thanks to a measure sponsored by Senator Diane Capehart and passed by this body, we will be developing a real-time crime center to monitor our growing network of closed circuit surveillance cameras. The use of technology and camera system has played an integral role in over 30 cases in the Virgin Islands, leading to arrests and closing vehicle accident investigations. Contracts are in place to add additional cameras to our schools, our roadways, our recreational parks to protect our people. We also added assets on the marine front with the purchase of two renegade go-fast vessels that have been in operation in St. Croix since July. The St. Thomas Units build-out is scheduled for completion in May. Through the assistance of our delegate to Congress, Stacey Plaskett, the VIPD has received an additional $4 million congressional appropriation for the purchase of three more of these go-fast vessels, one for each island. As our marine industry grows, As our marine industry grows, so should our enforcement capacity. But a large part of our crime prevention strategy is focused on discouraging convicted criminals from reoffending. We know that when provided with the appropriate support, previously incarcerated individuals can transform to rehabilitated citizens who contribute to our workforce. We have partnered with Align Community Inc. to ensure inmates get the wraparound services they need to be productive upon release. They will get workforce training and assistance with career placement. In addition, they will receive mentorship and counseling and be part of a cohort where they will receive additional support from peers and professionals on their transition back into society. This program complements the reentry program that begins in the Bureau of Corrections. The equine therapy program, which began last August, harnesses the therapeutic essence and our cultural love of horses. This groundbreaking program at the John Bell Correctional Facility has witnessed its first 11 graduates having experienced a journey of emotional healing and personal growth. The Bureau has also collaborated with Happy Homes to unveil the first transitional home on its campus. They actually have houses on campus at the correctional facility with two more on the way. This is significant because sometimes when inmates are released, they don't have anywhere to go. Second chances don't just benefit the individual. They, they, they benefit our entire community. <laughs> we all know when the mainland sneezes, the territories catch the cold. The economic and social issues plaguing the continent of the United States are slowly creeping their way into the territory. Our Department of Justice has tirelessly confronted many of these issues through vigorous prosecution. Although the fight against human trafficking, sexual abuse, the proliferation of opioid abuse, and tax evasion continues, the Department of Justice has demonstrated that it is up to the task. Through its effort, the Department of Justice has secured more than $1 million in opioid settlements and judgments to combat this growing epidemic. This will be administered through the Department of Health. The national opioid epidemic that started in the late 90s is now an active problem in this territory. Fentanyl, a synthetic opioid that is up to 50 times stronger than heroin, heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine, is a major contributor to fatal overdoses in the U.S. Unfortunately, it is now here in the territory. Last year, there were three confirmed deaths due to fentanyl overdoses. Three deaths are three too many. This month, the Division of Behavioral Health hosted a planning meeting for a territory-wide opioid overdose prevention, overdose prevention task force to center community engagement and address this growing crisis. 
I urge each of you and our entire community to get educated on the dangers and actively discourage our family and friends from abusing fentanyl and other opioids. We must not shy away from the ugliest parts of our community, but instead be resolute in our efforts to address them head on. Human trafficking and sexual abuse are real and present threats to our community. The territory has now received settlement funds resulting from human trafficking litigation, including proceeds from the sale of Great St. James, Little St. James, and other direct funds. These settlement funds include 20 million to support services to vulnerable, disenfranchised individuals and community organizations to address social ills, including sex trafficking, human trafficking, mental health initiatives, domestic violence, and poverty. An additional 25 million will supplement prosecution and enforcement measures within the territory. 15 more million will be allocated to mental health services. Last August, legislation strengthening support for human trafficking victims, including mandatory reporting requirements, was forwarded to the 35th Legislature for action. The proposed legislation recognizes and allocates an additional 11 million specifically to be used to combat human trafficking in the territory. Tonight, I implore this body to act on this legislation. The rollout of legalized cannabis industry in the Virgin Islands continues to make progress. This administration remains adamant about bringing the growth, sale, and purchase of cannabis to a legal and properly regulated market. This includes the first of its kind in the entire United States, a pathway to legal cannabis for sacramental use. I have also recently submitted to the legislature pertinent technical amendments to 8680 to address some of the remaining issues with the existing law. Tonight, I am pleased to announce the launch of the Cannabis Registry Program, starting with the medical practitioners and sacramental organizations being allowed to register. This will be followed by patient and sacramental users to begin in early April. Additionally, just a few months ago, 50 Virgin Islanders participated in cannabis training courses, including horticultural training, extraction and manufacturing and bud tending, ensuring that our community is prepared and educated to take advantage of this industry. By early September 2024, we expect to issue the inaugural license for dispensaries, cultivation and processing. Finally, the need to ensure that everyone can participate in this new industry makes the work of the Auto Expungement Task Force vital. The task force has been assembled and is working meticulously to expunge the criminal records of those who were previously convicted, convicted of simple possession and other, real, other related marijuana statutes. We are utilizing the best practice from the experience of other US jurisdictions to develop this industry in the right way. Since the creation of the Supreme Court in 2006, we have been served by three exceptional justices. As part of the continued growth of our Virgin Islands judiciary, tonight I wish to announce my intention to add another exceptional jurist to their ranks by nominating the Honorable Harold L. Willox to be a justice of the Virgin Islands Supreme Court. Judge Willocks is no stranger to the bench and the judicial community after serving more than two terms as a judge in the Superior Court. His prior per public service includes previously serving as the presiding judge of the Superior Court, chief public defender, and assistant attorney general. Judge Willocks is a consummate public servant, published author, and son of the soil. I'm confident that he will be a wonderful addition to the Supreme Court as an astute and deliberative justice. <laughs> Last year, the Virgin Islands Housing Authority completed the renovation of 82 public housing units at Walter I.M. Hodge Pavilion in Fredericksburg. Some of those units had been abandoned since 2000, 20 years. This is the first phase of the eventual renovation of 248 units at that site. The total project represents over $116 million being invested in upgrading affordable housing in Fredericksburg. <laughs> Large infrastructure projects like these are important drivers of our economy. 
Not only does it ma doesn't not only does it provide much needed affordable housing in the territory, but it also provides substantial employment for our people. People like Jose Soles, a laborer, and Billy Navarro, a laborer now apprentice as heavy equ equipment mechanic. Both are residents of this community and both are employed by the prime contractor, J. Benton Construction. We are tireless in our home ownership for Virgin Islanders and in our pursuit opportunities, we continue to promote our VI Slice program. VI Slice is a gap financing program administered by the EDA that helps eligible Virgin Islanders buy, build, and renovate their first home. It provides grants, not loans, grants of up to $200,000 for the purchase or construction of a home and up to $100,000 for down payment and closing costs. Since the program's launch in October 22, the VIEDA has executed a memo of agreement with six local mortgage lenders. Two of those lenders, Banco Popular de Puerto Rico and Merchants Commercial Bank, are offering construction lo loans. To date, VI Slice has helped nine local families in the U.S. Virgin Islands purchase their first home. Seven have closed on St. Croix and two closed on St. Thomas. As of December, there are 147 applications for homeowners assistance fund mortgage program. Funded with eight and a half million dollars from ARPA, the Housing Finance Authority paid out 918,000 in direct assistance to 70 qualified households. These funds provided relief for homeowners who experienced financial hardship during the pandemic and were used for mortgage reinstatements, mortgage payments, mortgage principal reduction, cases of foreclosure, delinquent property taxes, and insurance, just to name a few. We are steadfast in helping Virgin Islanders achieve and keep the goal of home ownership. The revitalization of our downtowns is a passionate goal of this administration. Last year, we were encouraged and helped tremendously by the private sector, whether it was Chris Pardo, or Peter Zilke in Christiansted, Shamari Moorhead, or John Alexander in Fredericksted, or Charles Kim, Uri Cohen, or Pash Daswani in Charlotte Amali, our private partners are stepping up. We continue to support their investments by installing modern infrastructure and public amenities that help sustain commercial activity. We remain dedicated to the ongoing enhancements to our towns and the surrounding areas. We successfully completed road rehabilitation, drainage, and safety improvements on all roads in Fredericksted, except for King, Queen, and Strand. Those three streets will finally be addressed this year with federal highway funds, finally eliminating the images of flooding streets with heavy rains. Christian set us underground extensive modernization of its underground utilities in the last few years. WAPA completed the replacement of its water lines in 21. Most recently, the Waste Management Authority completed a considerable upgrade of its wastewater system. That upgrade solves many issues we have experienced over the years with clogged sewer lines and overflowing manholes running sewer into the streets. Unfortunately, the constant excavation in the area has left the Christiansted roads in admittedly terrible condition. However, we must be reminded that Progress is disruptive, and a period of disruption is necessary to make way for prosperity. To have resilient and modern infrastructure, we have to dig up a few roads. Having said that, the Department of Public Works is standing by with a contract in place to bring in the full repair and, re and pavement of Queen, Market, Prince, East, and Hill Streets in Christiansted as soon as this wastewater project is complete. <laughs> In Charlotte Amalia, another long-standing project is coming to fruition. The overall design for Veterans Drive 2A is in final design review stages by the Federal Highway Administration. As a 2022 Department of Transportation raised grant, this project is one of 42 projects nationwide selected to expedite processing to ensure that the notice to proceed occurs this year. That's the highway that comes around the legislature and connects to Veterans Drive. Now, it has been a consensus for quite some time that the key to restoring our vitality to our downtowns is to restore residential living to the towns. 
truly creating live, work, and play spaces. Unfortunately, many of the residential structures within our towns that formerly housed some of our founding and most prominent families are now abandoned and dilapidated. While there is a shortage of properties available for home buyers and renters, we have hundreds of homes across the territory sitting in disrepair. Some admittedly beyond the point of repair. If we can successfully address those properties that are being neglected, it will not only remedy the blighted condition of our towns and our neighborhoods, but it would also help reduce the cost of residential rental rates throughout the territory. That is why, earlier today, my office submitted to this body the Brian Roach administration proposal for addressing abandoned and derelict buildings in our towns and neighborhoods. <laughs> this proposal is rooted in a property conservatorship model that is designed to remedy blight while protecting communities from the ill effects of gentrification. Let me say that again. If we wanted to take the properties, we could. They owe taxes on them. We want to keep it in our families, to protect our communities from the ill effects of gentrification. In developing this proposal, we have gathered public and private stakeholder input. We held public town hall meetings in both districts. Finally, after presenting the concept, we continued to gather public comments until a final draft proposal was prepared. I want to thank all the engaged residents who took the time and effort to read the draft and proposal and formally submit comments. There were good comments. But the proposal now stands before, the pro proposal now before the Senate reflects broad input and consensus on an approach tailored to meet our community's needs and concerns. But before this proposal was even publicly distributed, there were attempts to politicize the matter with misinformation and fear-mongering. Some attempted to put a cloud of suspicion over the proposal and build opposition for the sake of opposition. <laughs> However, buried in all of that noise was a real and legitimate concerns regarding potential gentrification of Virgin Islanders being dispossessed of their properties. I heard those, I heard those concerns, loud and clear. I also heard from Virgin Islanders who own property or have property in their families that they would appreciate seeing it restored. Those who want to do right by the property they have inherited. Those who know their siblings will never agree on a path forward, or that the absentee property owner is unconcerned and oblivious to the conditions of the property back home. All these voices were heard, considered, and ultimately resulted in the proposal which is now before the legislature. Some have suggested that this matter is too controversial and complex to successfully build consensus. I disagree. We are all motivated to solve a problem that is becoming increasingly obvious and persistent. It's not just a matter of the properties being held up in probate. Even when ownership is free and clear, we have property owners who are unable or unwilling from pre to prevent their properties from falling into disrepair. We must find a way to help those property owners help themselves. Nothing, nothing is too complicated, it's so complicated that cannot be simplified by hard work. The Honorable Vern Hart said it, and I believe it. So senators, let's get to work on solving the problem of abandoned and neglected derelict buildings in our towns and in our neighborhoods. I look forward to the legislative hearings to come. If you need me to come down here, I'm ready to stand by too. We stand ready to testify on our proposal and work along with you to develop the best solution for our people. On July 3rd, we celebrated the 175th anniversary of the emancipation of enslaved Africans and their descendants in the Danish West Indies. The Emancipation Commemoration Commission organized a year-long observance of the events and implications of that historic occasion. I want to thank the Commission's Chair, Carol Burke, Senator Carla Joseph, and the other Commission members for ensuring that all residents of this Virgin Islands acknowledge this critical and momentous part of history 
and the evolution of our people. We have certainly come a long way since 1848. Many of us are the descendants of enslaved Africans that resided right here in the Danish West Indies, on the United States mainland, or elsewhere in the Caribbean. As a people predominantly of color, we have progressed tremendously from the inhumane cruelty and unforgivable sin of chattel slavery. In fact, we may have progressed so far over the years that we now take some of those gains for granted. There was a time in these islands when education opportunities for people of color were limited. That is why I am worried that our residents are not capitalizing on the opportunity for a free college education, free college education being provided at the University of the Virgin Islands. There was a time when people of color did not own property. Each successive generation of residents of these islands strived to make property ownership much more attainable. That is why it is heartbreaking to see some property owners demonstrate an absence of pride by allowing their properties to become overgrown or filled with trash. There was a time when our ancestors were not valued. That is why I'm concerned that we associate, we associate with and enable violent criminals who similarly place little value on life. There was a time when we did not have the right to elect our leaders. They were selected for us. So I have grown uneasy that too many of us enjoy the spectacle of politics, but never personally get involved in making this community better for ourselves and our neighbors. We, we have certainly earned the right, through many years of struggle, to choose to have a callous disregard for history and the sacrifices of our ancestors. But I think we all know that if that becomes our collective choice, then it doesn't bode well for our future. The government certainly has a role to play. And as government leaders, we must see to the well-being of all Virgin Islanders. But that does not absolve us from doing our part as individuals. Yeah. From my first State of the Territory address to this present moment, I remain very optimistic about the future of these islands. I firmly believe luck is when opportunity meets preparedness. Over the last few years, our preparedness has met the opportunities leading us to positive outcomes and benefits. And while we are making great progress in keeping the promises we made to the people of the Virgin Islands, we are still constrained by our resources. As a result, that progress has required difficult decisions. Whether you're the head of your household or the head of state like me, leadership requires setting priorities and making uncomfortable but prudent decisions. To save the GRS system from insolvency, we have had to forego the revenues generated by the rum excise cover over and the capital projects they funded. To keep the cost of electricity manageable, we had to forego additional road repairs. To catch up on the backlog of income tax refunds, we have had to live with a less than ideal budget for facility maintenance. However, those sacrifices, however, through those sacrifices, our commitment has always been and will continue to be to provide the best possible quality of life for Virgin Islanders. 
and to create abundant opportunities for Virgin Islands prosperity. Senators, we may not always see eye to eye, but I trust we share a common vision for our community. Let us work together to connect our people with opportunities that are being produced right here at home. Together, let's promote responsible citizenship, build stronger families, cultivate a thriving economy, and transform our infrastructure. Let us continue to be resolute in our pursuit of progress for this territory, moving forward one step at a time. God bless you, and God bless the Virgin Islands. Love you. Uh, please remain in place until the governor leaves the chamber. Thank you very much, Governor, um, for your presentation on the state of the territory this evening. God bless you as well. Please be seated. Recognize the departure of Lieutenant Governor Trigenza Roach. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Have a good night. Right now, we are witnessing the departure of Lieutenant Governor Treganza Roach. His mother is the lady you see in the purple dress, looking very lovely this evening, and Senator Carla Joseph is escorting the both of them. I know on the campaign trail, many refer to Mrs. Roach as Mama Roach, mm -hmm. and uh, she is always a mainstay and a fixture at her son's side at these events as they are being escorted out of the well. The Lieutenant Governor's sister is also with him this evening, also a regular fixture with the Lieutenant Governor. We are outside, you're seeing footage from outside of the chambers, and the Governor's security is there, and both vehicles are prepped and awaiting their departure to the post state of the territory reception that is taking place at Fort Christian. As the members of the judiciary are now leaving the chambers, led by Justice Reese Hodge. I see presiding Judge Deborah Watlington and members of our federal court, Judge Malloy, Judge Galavan. Well, and they'll be followed by I think we still have a panel. We don't want to mess this one up. I do believe we definitely have a benediction. So yeah. we're going to um, make sure that when the minister, pastor, whatever wow. member of the cloth comes on, we're going to stop for that. But briefly, initial thoughts on the governor's speech. I felt like I've heard a lot of it before. I just listened to it. I feel like we're just in this wilderness. We're led to where we think we're going to get out. And then it's, oops, you got to turn back around. It's like a journey that, according to the governor, was supposed to take us maybe two years. Now we're into his sixth year, and we're still right where we are. Not one school has been built. I've heard a lot of what he, what he said tonight. 
he said before, just using different words. Hmm. Very interesting. But there were some exciting things. When, okay. When we get into the panel, um, yeah, like sure. you know, I was excited to hear about the potential that the non-insured, yes, right, have an avenue that they can now get health insurance because that is so. Yes, I think that was one of the most significant parts yeah. of the speech. We'll come back to you, Mr. Hodge. Initial initial thoughts on uh, the governor's speech. No, no, I thought it was comprehensive, but as can be expected. Um, it's not possible to speak on every subject matter. Oh, like uh, the former Senate president said, we'd be here till morning, right? But, but we did get um, a good overview of some of the things I wanted to hear about. I got a feel for where he's going with energy. Um, got a feel for the economy. Got to see where we are with the, with the unemployment rate being 3.3 percent or whatever below the national average, which is some one of the indicators I'd like to see. GDP growth is one I was looking for as well. Um, I anticipated a spike after COVID, given that we opened our borders before everyone else. So seeing where we are in relation to that was a good indicator for me as well. So there's a lot of things that, that did come out in the, in the address that I, I wanted to hear. And I'm sure we can dive into a little deeper as we move through tonight. Sure. Attorney St. John, uh, one of the things the governor tempered his economic shorism, let's call it that, with was that there are still some headwinds that we have to, to make it through. What do you think, what did you think about that particular analogy that while we're good, there's still some bumps in the road that we're gonna come up on? Well, I appreciate his honesty, right? Um, he could have come in and just put fluff uh, uh, and, and try to argue you know, uh, that things are all great and peachy, but he was honest uh, and he said, look, a lot of our numbers are down, right? Revenue collection is down, hotel rooms are down, uh, flights to the territory, down. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that. I like that he focused in on some of that. I would like to see a little bit more detail. For example, when you mentioned unemployment rate, you can't mention that without mentioning the labor force participation rate, right? How many people have left after the census? Things like that to really yes. give it context. Because if you're saying on the one hand, we're not paying vendors, and on the other hand, unemployment is record low, that doesn't make sense because you're not paying vendors, people are getting laid off. So I'd like to see a little more elaboration, but overall he touched on the exact issues that, that we wanted to, to address, especially the roads, which, which affects um, economic transactions as well. So that was very important that he had a plan to fix the roads regarding Christian Stead, because a lot of people wanted to hear that. Senator Richards, um, to Attorney Henry's point, I almost felt like having read a couple of these, that um, there's a template that's being used um, in terms of the order that things were spoken about. Did you get that, that feeling at all? Well, I thought I heard it before, <laughs> but I think uh, more, more, more importantly, though, and uh, I, I want to, to make this um, caveat since I, I did um, make that statement um, prior to us going to the, to the live um, broadcast of um, Governor Bryan's um, speech, where I uh, made mention of um, at times we, we tend to focus on what the governor did not talk about in comparison to what he talked about. And I don't want the impression to be left that anyone's impression, opinion, or feeling about what should have been talked about is not important. But the mere fact that he didn't talk about it is indicative of what the governor's priorities are. And so that um, in, in the governor's um, speech, his, um, his priorities remain consistent over the past four yes. or five presentations. Um, whether or not he has successfully um, achieved the, the, the goals, objectives, and priorities that he has identified on his own through his speeches on behalf of his administration is um, something that we will be able to, to discuss in detail because I think um, although all of us um, don't have a bird's eye view of the situation, all of us do have the opportunity to experience and to see what is actually going on within our community. And I think it's the responses from our community, our citizenry, um, speaks clearly yes. about, about, about the problems that, um, that they are experiencing. And the emotions uh, are no longer just emotions of feelings. They have now become emotions of experiences. I, the governor ended up his um, presentation with, with a little phrase that I just um, want to turn it backwards a little bit. He says, um, for me, I turn it backwards. In fact, opportunities do, in fact, exist. 
and I'm turning it back what it said, but it's evident that a lack of preparedness also exists. And this is what people are, are, are facing because we have a large volume of opportunity, whether um, the financial resources of the federal government, the ability to, um, to mold our, our labor force and to engage our younger people. All that opportunity exists. Whether or not we have taken advantage of that opportunity is what is of question in his presentation this evening. I think to your point, what happens on these panels sometimes and with political pundits in general, we try to show our breadth and knowledge of a subject matter by saying, oh, agriculture didn't get covered enough, which in this speech I didn't hear a mention of agriculture and given the importance of food security. Um, I think that's what happens. But I, you, you make some very valid points. In fact, in the speech, the one area where I did hear preparedness, well, there were two technically. Uh, preparedness for industry. He talked about his cannabis legislation and the fact that they will be moving to finally admit practitioners in April and the fact that 50 Virgin Islanders went away, received training, and he spoke of the various areas that they received training in to be prepared for the industry. Now, if you take that approach, what I would have loved to have heard, and even in previous state of the territories, especially after the storms, we know we have to rebuild. So who are we sending to get uh, construction management certified, project management certified? We should have been doing this from 2017, 2018. The, the heavy equipment operator certification, the CDL licenses to drive the, the heavy equipment and all those things that come with rebuilding an economy. Those are the programs that should have been in the University of the Virgin Islands, in our schools. I mean, some of them exist now, yes, but that education where you know, it's great to hear 50 Virgin Islanders went away and got certifications in cannabis. Fantastic. But that doesn't rebuild an economy. And I think that um, that level of preparation is what, and this is, uh, doesn't all fall on Governor Bryant's plate, but that is where we should have been thinking as a territory. And I remember being on the radio speaking with Governor Mapp, let's send our children away from now because we know it's going to take some time for this money to be spent. We know it's going to take some time for this recovery. But are we any more prepared now than we were in September of 2017? And that's the question. So just, a, a, just a quick clarity. And not, I'm not just advocating the, um, the disbursement of our young people out of the territory for training, because we, ha we should find some way to incorporate the majority of the training within our existing structure and system. I mean, why do we have voc ed mm -hmm. in public schools sure. if we can't find a way for contractors to include our voc ed students who should be um, studying um, the, the principle of um, plumbing, masonry, electrical, e e e electricity with all these um, homes that are in need of repairs. And so that, that is something that I, I think that we're lacking of, of how to best utilize existing resources in comparison to the, because we, we send our children away and they get good experience and good offers at home, I mean abroad, they're not coming back home. And, and, and one of the things, uh, Attorney St. John, that the governor mentioned, I think is so essential. Um, and Hugo, I'm gonna come to you too with the energy piece, because a couple things stuck out with me on that, um, that I have some questions about, and you are the most prepared person to answer them. But when you talk about housing and, and our young people coming home, um, I know, for instance, I have siblings that would love to return to the territory. One in particular has a son that is autistic, and the resources that my nephew gets in the educational system in Richmond, Virginia, is not available here. Occupational therapists, speech therapists, at, you know, in the school and widely available. We have one occupational therapist that might be servicing dozens and dozens, and so they get overwhelmed. Um, and, and so the services aren't there that they would like. And the housing, I want to talk specifically about housing, uh, Attorney St. John. What did you hear that gives you optimism for the future about housing? Because we cannot return our people to a place where they cannot afford to live. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, I have many young professional colleagues uh, who refuse to return home because in part of a lack of housing. Um, I would have liked to see a little bit more discussion of quality of life issues. Um, such, as, like, such as housing. Housing is a major one. Mm -hmm. You want to know how you develop housing in the territory? You grow the economy. You invite the big tech firms here. 
You invite the big uh, professional firms, the Walmarts, the, the Targets. You, know, you get people here, the corporate offices. Guess what? Soon enough, the private sector is going to build that condo. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to invite them. Grow the economy. The private sector is going to see an opportunity to make money, and those condos are going to sprout right up. Grow the economy. Grow the tax base. The housing will follow. The solar initiative and the federal funding that's available for the territory. One of the most interesting pieces of the speech to me was the fact that the governor announced that the uh, energy office is in the process of applying for $100 million for solar on individual homes, especially low-income individuals. What does that mean for the finances of WAPA? Earlier on, you talked about the, gov the government subsidizing WAPA through the last uh, year plus, and still subsidizing WAPA to make sure that you know, the rates didn't get increased. We all know that when people come off the grid and they're not paying that WAPA bill anymore, the finances of the authority are hurt adversely. What does this mean and where is the equilibrium we'll have to reach? Because, yeah, it's great to hear that news. And I'm going to look into that program. We know the president just passed a solar stimulus program federally. But how is that going to affect the Water and Power Authority? The, the bottom line is that the old model of the, of the electric system that's a, a radio system with a centralized plant is no more. Um, I've been given a, a speech on, on the change and the, and the morph of, of power systems for about six, seven years now, and the day is coming. So WAPA has to change its model. The current model is not going to be sustainable. As the people that can afford to pay their bill the most come off the grid, you still have fixed costs, and you spread that amongst those who can least afford to pay the bill. It's called in our industry the debt spiral. So what has to happen is the centralized grid has to go away. It has to become more um, areas of, of centralized, of decentralized energy, and, and more, more of a, a, a less of a distributed uh, system. Um, it's going to happen because Customers have now access to, to solar and different mechanisms that make their own systems more efficient and more affordable. Mm -hmm. The price of solar has come down. Yep. Uh, the price of battery storage has come down. Um, you're able to build your own systems. And a plan, the governor's plan now speaks to the largest bogey out there. The issue you've had for many years is that everybody keeps touting solar for rooftops. But you have a, a home ownership rate less than 50%. So if you have over 50% of renters and, and lessors, then they don't get access to rooftop solar. But this plant that's being put into place right now has community solar in it. It has putting plants out in fields, and uh, a, a renter can own a piece of that and affect their power bill. That's a game changer. This allows every citizen to get a piece of the pie and access to, to green energy and, and, and energy, uh, sustainable energy, and energy independence. So it, it's gonna it's gonna require WAPA that you, if WAPA if WAPA is is ahead of the thinking, it becomes. And that's what I was gonna ask you because one of the things the governor said in every state of the territory and on the campaign trail is that he is committed to fixing WAPA. Mm -hmm. My question is: Is the fix and the solution for problems that exist today, or is the fix and the solution going to be for the dynamics you speak about, which is probably going to be implemented in seven to 10 years from now? That's the question. It Are we fixing question. for a problem that exists now, which based on what you're just saying, we need to be ahead of that crisis. I would say both. And I would say that it's being fixed for what's taking place now, but it's gonna, if WAPA has to get ahead of where it's going. It's, it's like Kodak. You can't sit down there and continue to make film where everybody's going digital. You've got to get ahead of it and, and, and move in that digital form. And WAPA has to get out of the, the model that it has right now. It has to get more of a decentralized system. And it, has to, it should be playing a role as the, the leading agency in what the government is speaking about. If you lead it and you're the one installing, putting in these systems, maintaining these systems, you have sustainable you have viability. But if you are behind, you don't. Attorney um, Henry, I'm going to come back to you, but we'd like to hear from those of you watching us on Channel 12, streaming this broadcast on Facebook, or listening to us on the radio at WTJX FM 93.1. Give us a call now at 340-718-3339. That's 340-718-3339. 
and share your thoughts on the governor's state of the territory address. Now, to your area of specialty, the, ed the environment, DPNR, um, I thought it was very interesting that one of the most, uh, we talked about building permits, the change in uh, building permits that we've seen year over year, the governor touted that as a strong economic indicator. Um, that was all, that was good to hear. It's at least good to know that we're gonna be steady in terms of private development um, and, and for all intents and purposes, it seems like the economy of construction will continue on the commercial and residential side within the territory. But one of the things I consider to be interesting, and it might be boring to people, is this hoopla program that he discussed that will give Virgin Islanders access to books through their library card. Um, are you familiar with the hoopla system as a former commissioner of the department? And what do you think about the uh, library system in the territory right now? Well, um, I know that this is a plan that we were looking to initiate under the previous administration. Um, we weren't calling it hoopla, but when you look at states, when they're able to, for example, say, we have a library collection of over a million books. The reason why they're able to say that is because it's a system where they're able to collaborate among their counties and, and their various jurisdiction to have a system that if you have a library card in, at one library, you can utilize it throughout the system. And we were looking to um, merge, if you will, the university library system, uh -huh. DPNR's library system, and the Department of Education's library system into one system where people were able to utilize the entire Virgin Islands library system. And it seems to me that this is what Hoopla is trying to do. So I think it's an excellent idea, um, especially I think that a lot of students, this is now over on the St. Thomas side, still have issues with accessing the um, Charles Turnbull Library based on where it's at. Um, we've been able to get bus service there to, to, to accommodate students a little bit more, but we know that the library, at least when I was there, was able to shift the hours to six o'clock. And the, the goal was to continue to move it along, to have it open more in the evening so parents can come and participate with their children. So to me, a system like this, you can go to UVI mm -hmm. that has better hours, but still be able to access books that UVI may not have but they might be at DPNR's public library system. So I think it's an excellent idea. I just, if you may, I agree with, with what um, Mr. Hodge was talking about, energy security. I think it's just, it's so important, Leslie, in that one of the things that we have done very well is be the leaders in the, this concept of residential um, having a cistern. It has saved us over and over again, especially during hurricanes. Remember in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. they didn't even have water to drink. Yeah. But a lot of us still had access to water yes. through our, cist our cisterns. We're going to talk about water and the governor's comments on the water crisis this, yes. here in St. Croix, Croix in a second. But we have a retired educator on the line from the island of St. Croix. So let's go to that individual. Good evening. You're on the air caller. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Yes, this is Basil Williams, a uh, retired educator on the island of St. Croix. Thank you for calling, sir. And I, I just want to emphasize the need for us to pay more attention to education. And sir, I absolutely agree. In fact, we were just talking about the library and access, and I wanted to tie it in to our standardized test scores in the territory. Yeah, uh, and I, the I, fact I, that I'm, learning is so I'm, important. I'm also a UVI instructor, mm -hmm. and it, it's appalling the numbers that we see as it relates to uh, students entering UVI that are not prepared for college-level mathematics and English language. And uh, we could talk all day long and all night long uh, about different things in the, in the realm of economics, but the, the, we go back 
to education. Yes. And I don't feel that there's a, a serious effort to mitigate the deficiencies we are seeing in the educational system. We need to drop everything and talk about education and do something about our educational struggles because it's scary. I've been in the system for 30 years. I'm still in the system. I'm uh -huh. at the college level, and it's not unusual for the val and sal of a school to also uh, have to take skills courses at the university. I'm, I've, I've heard that, sir, and I absolutely believe you. And it's so your your call is actually perfect timing because I was going to segue our library conversation into education, reading, and standardized test scores. So I appreciate your call. Okay, and, and finally, uh, more troubling uh, is that because of the lack of opportunities locally, uh -huh. the ones that are doing well tend to relocate, and the, well, the ones that are struggling tend to be, uh, uh, you know, have no choice but to stay, and therefore we end up having a population of potential employees that mm -hmm. may be less than prepared. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your call, sir. You have a great evening. Thank you for calling into the program. Um, Senator Richards, to the caller's comments, I saw you shaking your head, and you might even know um, our UVI instructor that, that, that called in. What, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, we, we both grew, grew up on, up on the hill in, in Ferdinand, in between the, the graveyard and Hospital Street. <laughs> but um, Principal Williams, um, hit the nail on the head, and, and it was what I was uh, making reference to earlier when I was speaking about um, opportunities and putting more focus into the education. At that point, I we used vocational education as an example of how best to make sure that we, we, we prepare students within our school system in comparison to sending them oh, a wait. few of them away yeah. for some training, and a few of them may come back or all may come back, but the majority are still um, left within the structural uh, system that we have. It is, um, I'll be quick and short and to the point, um, uh, Principal Williams' um, position is um, fundamentally, in my mind, correct. If, if we're not educating, and that means not only the formal education, training, and preparation of our human resources, our manpower, yeah. to maintain what we would like to uh, refer to as our Virgin Islands home, then we are, we are in great trouble. And so even the economy, as you mentioned, any one of those items, we have to do something about that. Hugo, I'll come to you. I see you wanting to add something to that conversation. The education thing, I can talk about all night because it's a passion for me. Um, but let's go to this caller from St. Thomas. Caller, good evening. You're on the air. Good evening. Good evening to the panel. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, go. good evening to you. Thank you. Hey, go. I'll listen to the, the governor, uh, Peter Kerry. But what bothered me, what bothered me, you know, what bothered me a lot here, you know, living in St. Thomas over 40 years, you know, and, and it bothered me. I went to school with Mr. Hugo Hodge. We graduated at the same time. I know Ms. Dawn Henry for many years. And the crime here in the Virgin Islands is, is outrageous, and he touched much on that. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's like every time you look around, somebody getting shot in the border, the year does that. And then somebody don't get shot. I mean, I mean, where are we gonna make a, a, a change in this in this place? I may have been Thomas in the seventies and the eighties. The crime was never like that. Never like that. You go along, you drive. I take Mr. Benton along the island, and I take him in a lot of different places. I take Mr. Benton from the from the time I pick you up, did you see a police ever pass me? He said, No, Mr. Tombo. I did not see no no no, no police pass up on the road. What are we going to do? Okay. What are we going to do? Let me have the panel address that. Thank you so much for your call. Education and crime are cousins, crime. brother and sister. Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't address our education issues, um, you know, all the, I think almost every one of our issues in this territory stems from education. Education is the foundation of it all. Go ahead, Hugo. We, we must take a step back, though. We have an erosion of the family structure. Oh, yeah. And the family structure's erosion plays a role in everything we're speaking about. The school system has their role, but the household has their role as well. And many times we get in this conversation about crime, about education, 
and all of these kin topics, and we don't go back to the root cause. I'm an engineer by trade, and in engineering school, we learn to do root cause analysis. And when I look at what's happened to the home structure, and I know what came from it as far as education, as far as what we put up with, with what, what our kids bring into the house. When we were growing up, you couldn't bring in a bracelet from somebody that was outside. Your parents tell you to take it back. Absolutely. I didn't buy it for you. But now, we have an erosion of what's taking place, and we're putting all the onus on the government. The government has their role, and a significant role at that. But we have to accept our role in how we fix this society. Absolutely. That's a great point that you make. Um, to Mr. Hodges' point, uh, Attorney St. John, the we didn't hear about programs for that type of social building um, in, in the speech. And again, I, I, to, to Senator Richard's point, we don't like to harp on what wasn't said. But if you're going to reverse engineer program since Hugo is an engineer and get to the root cause, I think that we're hitting on points that uh, we see the manifestations of this daily. And um, some people may feel it almost it's fluff or, or individuals that are policymakers might view these things as fluff. But to the point uh, Mr. Hodge made, your first teachers are in your household. Your mother and father are essentially your first teachers. And when we have parents that don't put enough value on education, that teacher could work as hard as they want, be as innovative as they want. If what is happening in the classroom is being reprogrammed or unprogrammed at home or not supported at home, you're not going to see the level of progress in students that you need to see. And if, uh, to our point about reading, if the love of reading and a thirst for learning in general doesn't come from that home originally, a teacher could try to do what they want. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I actually served as a prosecutor um, historically, and I got a chance to work with a lot of the young men uh, in the community. And one of the points that I always saw, I mean, sometimes I would see a juvenile come in and say, man, this juvenile is, something is wrong with this kid. And I thought he was bad and I until I saw the mother walk in. Uh, and, I, and I say this to say that I never saw, almost never saw fathers. So that, that was, c completely didn't happen. So going to the point of the, of the family being completely getting, um, gotten rid of in our, in our community, I think that's on point. Uh, we have to revert back to the nuclear uh, family. Um, it's probably too late to do that. I don't know how you reverse engineer time, right? After somebody's grown, you can't just pass a law to reinstate the family unit that it didn't have. Um, I agree that with the caller that there's been a lot of crime. I think the nature of crime is changing. I think crime is, is becoming a little more flagrant. People are gunning down police officers. Well, the governor did I mean, said it's, it's there's different. a lot of angry young men in this territory when talking about crime and how we resolve our conflict resolution. He mentioned the Office of Gun Violence and the fact that they have intervened in violent crimes, which is good to hear. He mentioned six incidences of retaliatory crime in the last year that he knows for a fact that the office has intervened and helped to resolve, which is great. He also spoke about YRC essentially being an overpriced babysitting service. That's the word that, words that he used um, to demonstrate that it is no longer effective. What I didn't hear was a thorough alternative to YRC, but we have some callers, so let's go to them. Caller, good evening. You're on the air. Yes, uh, good evening. I was just giving a call, but I just wanted to find out what's the process of the, uh, the status, excuse me, of the Envision program, because we have elderly people that have been trying to get their roofs done and their homes taken care of since the hurricane of 2017. Okay, I'll have uh, a member of the panel try to address that program. That's a good question. Um, I didn't hear very much about the InVision program, so. Uh... <laughs> I, I, I'm here <laughs> laughing, not at you, but with you, because um, the point that I was making is that um, those things that this state of the territory address did not address by the governor are those things that they clearly understand are not being done and have not been prioritized. I mean, the, 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 the education. And I, I, I wanted to, to chime in on, on this um, subject matter of um, families in, in, in regards to, um, to, 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 to us um, sit, sitting in, in, in the pew, but not in the pulpit and speak to the, 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 the fact that um, the problems that we have with our children is because of, of family, but it's not because of the family that we have problems with children. 
what we have is a society yes. and a structure that has not been designed to enhance and utilize the family structure that, that we knew of prior to being brought here and the family structure that we knew of in our early 50s, 60s, and 70s, that has diminished. And so we, we, we have a, a system of, um, of materialism, capitalism, um, I before you, let's one up each other, and not a collective system of how best do we utilize it. And we're back to, uh, to what principle William was talking about, it starts with education. Yeah. You, you, you look at um, school size. We've, we, we've now removed um, at the A. Richards Junior High School, which was set in a community and based to, to deal with a particular community, sent, um, supposedly to put it in the center of the island, move it out of that community structure. We had gone breaking and we said start yet. But the point I'm making is that schools have to become a part of the community of where they're at. And, I, and I'm speaking from experience. I've been on um, PTAs um, for, for every single school that my daughters went to mm -hmm. here on St. Croix. Um, I, I've worked with um, putting together USBI Parent Teacher Students Association as the coordinator for that whole effort so they could be part of the national PTA. But we have to find some way to have the involvement. And all of us are not the same. So all the mothers and all the fathers and all the parents are not going to be the same. But we have to find some way to build them up so that they could be also part of this community. I believe we may have a member of the legislature on the line. Good evening, caller. You're on the air. Hi, good evening. How are you? This is Senator Jonathan Gregory. Good evening, Senator. Thank you for calling into the program. Thank you. What are your initial thoughts on what you heard from the Governor's State of the Territory address and what for you stood out the most? Um, covered uh, the economy, roads, the disaster recovery, education, health care. Uh, he spoke on crime and gun violence. He touched on housing. You're breaking up a little bit, Senator. Your reception is a little bit off. That's, that's a can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> can you hear me better? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so what was very, um, one of the things that definitely stood out is the discussion around where we're going with the economy and the fact that um, we, uh, we've we seen some jobs come online in 2023. We've uh, seen an increase in building permits. Uh, 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 the so we've seen the rebuilding of a new hotel in uh, St. Thomas in particular. So it's my hope that we will see the revenues come in as a result of um, you know, those projects, we should see an uptick in our economy. We see that in the beginning of this year, 2020, seeing that increase in the, uh, in our revenues over last fiscal year at this same time. So that was encouraging, but we have to continue to push in order to ensure that we continue to see the, uh, the uptick in our revenues. Uh, what, what is of concern to me and it remains of concern is our ability to move our disaster projects along. Um, it is important. He did share with us his plan uh, to move those disaster projects along. He didn't really say when that would come online, but I'm looking forward to seeing that because it's a component that's tied to our fiscal year 24 budget. So the expectation is that um, I didn't hear that our, uh, the, 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 the uh, demolition of Shah Tamali High School, which is very important to us, as um, you know, in this particular district, but we did hear that they were school in St. Croix. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of work going on. But my primary focus is how do we ensure that we are able to, um, you know, cover our resources, our expenses rather, to support the initiatives that we pass in our 2024 budget. So I'm looking um, with regards to WAPA in particular. Um, he did share that there's a lot of uh, projects that's coming along, the wind power project, the solar, the solar power system project. He was definitely short on not sharing when we would be able to see, though, some um, level of reduction in our utility expenses. So I'm looking forward to working with the administration so we can really bring a lot of these things to fruition. He did close by saying, look, 
Um, in order for us to get these things done, we have to work together as a, uh, as a Virgin, Island, Virgin Islanders, as Virgin Islands leaders. So I'm looking forward to definitely working with the governor and his team to ensure that we are able to get a lot of these things done. There were things that were promised last time that, um, you know, we didn't really see. Um, there, there was some funds set aside for the purposes of, um, of uh, the Melvin H. Heavens Highway. Uh, Senator, you're um, breaking up a little bit. Hello? Yeah. Hear Yeah, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is we have some other callers, and I think we got the gist. Unfortunately, your transmission wasn't 100 percent, but we got most of what you were saying. Okay, thank you. Very what what matters here is that we work together collectively to get these things done. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's a demonstration of one of the frustrations that Virgin Islanders have been dealing with in terms of our infrastructure, um, our communication infrastructure in the, in the 21st century. Um, but we have another member of the legislature we believe on air, and we'll like to try to get them out. Caller, good evening. You're on the air. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Yes, uh, I'm calling about the water situation. Okay. Glenn. Go ahead, sir. You're on the air. Okay, good evening. My name is Everett Goodwin. I live in Glen. You ever take a shower in rusty water? Unf I took I yeah, I took a shower in rusty water last night in Glen. Rusty, rusty water. The water was turned off in two days. I was using my system. Uh huh. And then I turned it over to Wapper Water. Right? I have clear water was scheduled to me from my sister. Yes. When I turned on the water, water, went in the shower, to my surprise, when I opened my eyes, you don't want to see the water. So really, let me, let, really rusty. Uh, let me ask you a quick question, though. As it relates to the governor's state of the territory address and what he said regarding water, were you, uh, what, what, what were your impressions? What did you think about what the governor had to say? I, I actually, I didn't hear a part, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't hear a part. Okay. But, um, well, we're trying to discuss what was specifically um, in the speech, but the panel, he did mention the water situation on St. Croix, so I'd like to take that conversation to members of the panel, if you don't mind. Okay, okay, but I'm just saying, where, okay, before you go, yes. who can I carry, I, I bottle the water, who can I take it to tomorrow? <laughs> I would recommend you to finding a lab, perhaps in the phone book, that you could get it tested at, and that's the best recommendation. Or you may contact the Department of Planning and Natural Resources and see what information they could give you about testing and the content of your water. Okay, one more question. Where does the CEO for WAPA reside? I, I, I don't know that, sir, and I can't answer that question for you. But have a great evening, and thank you for your call. Um, the water situation. During the speech, we were discussing what the governor said, and uh, specifically, and I don't have the text in front of me, but it didn't sound like there was a crisis. And essentially, he said that. Yes, what, were your, what was your take on that? Well, regarding the, um, the rust brown water, he made it clear that the solution to that is to replace the piping system. Mm -hmm. And he says, but it's he also easy. said it's a 20, it's it had rusty <laughs> water for 20 years, yeah. basically. So it's kind of yes. like, okay, well, yes. are yeah. you custom to it? So yes, we don't really have a crisis. You think that's the reality though, listening to individuals like that? Absolutely not. It's, it, it, it is a crisis because if it was that simple, we would have already, because listen, DPNR, we get through, um, I don't remember the exact name of it, but it's the drinking water funding that helps with um, giving portable water, clean portable water, um, and wastewater. Mm -hmm. And we get millions every year. There was a point where DPNR was holding close to $30 million that was available to the authority and to waste management for replacing this infrastructure system. So again, it goes back to it's not just that we don't have the money. There is an issue that has been going on here in the territory about implementation. 
doing what we are supposed to do with the resources that have been given to us so that more can come in and we can just build on it. When he talked about um, the issue with the lead, for me, what was, what was good was that we didn't have the lead crisis that they told us we had. But now, as a citizen, I have to now walk backwards and say, okay, so the government put this fear in the community to the extent that the president declared an emergency because we had lead in our water system. And all of that was not true. So how do we have the US EPA on ground, DPN on ground, WAPA on ground, and they deploy the wrong testing method they were testing as to why the water was running brown, and they used that testing method to say there was lead throughout the system. When the protocol is, when you're testing for lead, you have to go to the top. And when they eventually did that, they had to now reverse everything they said to the community, remove all of this scare, and say, oh, by the way, all the homes are clear, it's only three. One of the, two of them is really at the meter, and the other one is probably because of the brass fitting in that particular home. You are extensively and intimately, uh, you know, ingrained in this issue of water distribution. What were your, what's your takes on how things have unfurled with the, the lead scare that uh, Commissioner Henry just mentioned and where we're at now. And then how do we fix issues like the caller that just called in? Well, first let me start by saying I didn't take the 20 year conversation, I mean, or 20 year existence as uh, a, a, a so what kind of thing. I, I took it as a, as a, a problem that we've known for, for quite some time. And it's not a $30 million problem, it's a billion dollar problem. So it, it, it's, we, we've had some limited funds here and there, but I know when I was at, in the, at the helm, we, we projected about a billion dollars to eradicate the issue by changing all the lines. Um, the, the lines are rated for about 30 years. Anything on the ground has a 30-year life expectancy. We have lines in the ground that are 80 years old, 90, 75 years old. They used to, the technology at, at, that was the best practice at that time was ductile iron lines with a lining. That is no longer what's used. PVC is used extensively, but a ductile iron, the lining is now gone. With that gone, there's rust. Mm -hmm. There's rust throughout the system. And if there's one thing that I could say was a challenge that I just had no way of eradicating during my tenure was that, that whole rusty water issue is because it, it takes funding. But, it, but it's decisions that we make as a government um, that, that make that more exacerbating. Like, for example, WAPA is a standalone system. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not allowed to charge a customer charge by law. A senator changed <laughs> that and made it a law that it can't charge a, a fee to be on the system. Okay. It's only revenue, it's when somebody uses it, whether there's a crack in the cistern or whatever the case may be. Up until 1987, it was law to have your own system, cistern. The law only was modified then. If you didn't live on the system, then you could do a house without... If, if you lived on a WAPA system, then you can do a house without a cistern. Not much construction has taken place in those areas since that time. So pretty much every house has to have a cistern. So you have a standalone system that is funded by use whenever the customer wants to use it. You can't project revenue. You can't go to the bank. You can't get financing. So it's now in a situation where it's got a billion dollar problem and no method of, of getting financing to, to fix it. And it's just a daunting task. Let's get back to some of the callers. Caller. Caller, good evening. You're on the air. Hey, good evening. This is uh, Principal Williams uh, calling back. Real quickly, since so we could get yeah. some other but callers in. I, I wanted to highlight the problem we have in education generally, in that once students get to uh, UVI, even though education is free at UVI, the enrollment has been dropping. Dwindling. That indicates to me that people have been struggling in the K-12 system don't want to struggle any further. Mm. It could be free. Who wants to struggle for free? 
Mm -hmm. Understood. And that's a good point. And, and we'll talk about that real briefly. Um, in recent kids count numbers, we see that the population of students in the territory has been halved since the storms. Mm -hmm. And that point that was just made about participation in a, in a higher education, if you're struggling in K through 12, why are you going to go to UVI to struggle? And I understand that. And although the education is free, if you don't excel and don't feel good about your education, in the system, once you out, you like, thank God, this is over. You know, that's how a lot of students feel about school. So right, why right. would I go back? Yeah, why would I go back? Um, how do we, let me ask you, Attorney St. John, how do we remedy that issue? And do you think you heard tonight the components that are necessary to remedy that issue? Well, th this is a truly vexing problem. Um, you have a couple pr issues here. Uh, first, the point was made that students who are struggling in high school don't want to struggle in college. What's interesting to me is, as low as the test scores are, um, we're not seeing lower graduation rates. I think we, we actually had a higher graduation rate. So which is interesting is they're not performing well on the national tests, but in fact people are graduating. Uh, well, the governor said the graduation rate has gone up by exactly 4%. It went that's from 74 to 78%. I remember him specifically so, saying so, that. So how does that track, right? Also. If you look at the graduations, I was at a recent graduation, a large portion of the graduating classes are honors. Interestingly, they're graduating with honors. So I don't think the issue is that, well, they're obviously not performing because we have objective criteria, but they're, they feel as though there's an honors, grad, they're, 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 they're honors graduate. So it, it's in, I'm not sure that it's tracking that they're not performing so they don't want to go to college. I think a lot of them are applying and they feel as though they're doing well, even though nationally yeah. the, the, the studies aren't there. Um, but it's a truly vexing problem. We need to work um, with the teachers to figure out what the problem is. Uh, it, it, look, this has been done in other jurisdictions. We're not the only jurisdictions that have test score crises and have them improve. Figure out what works, get the smart people on the ground, and let's do it. Senator Richards, to Attorney St. John's point, uh, we have our standardized test scores that are appalling and, quite frankly, scary when you read them. But yet we have all these honor graduates. And 74 to 78%, I don't know about y'all, but that was a C when I went to school, and Cs weren't acceptable in my household. So I don't consider that to be something that is an achievement, per se. If we're in that upper 89, mid 90 percentile where we should be striving for, then I'll say, you know what, hip hip hooray. But that's not the case. What do you think about that paradox that we have there, that we're graduating people that think, yeah, I'm an honor student. But as uh, Mr. Williams said, when they get to UVI, you have a valedictorian, a salutatorian of, a, core, of a, a school in the Virgin Islands, a high school in the Virgin Islands taking remedial courses? I'm going to begin where um, Tony St. John um, left off, because I, I wholeheartedly agree with him. But um, what we're, we're doing. Um, this evening as we discuss education. Um, and I think a lot of us in the territory, we, not only do we may have had bachelors and masters and, and PhD in this particular subject, which is um, pointing out short files. I mean, um, you know, that's, a, that's a thing we master in, in the Virgin Islands. The, the subject matter that we, we now need to take up is um, how do we address short files? How do we come up with um, programs redesigning uh, refocusing mm -hmm. um, the, the, the educational system. If we don't have one to, to, to enforce um, laws that speaks to, um, to who we are, our Virgin Island history, our culture, the history of us as a people, how, how do we make education meaningful to the students that are in our communities? Um, and I, I had to have a, a quick example. Just the other day I heard um, a, a former member of the legislature, he was on a talk show and he spoke to the fact how he had de designed at the St. Croix Educational Complex for students from both public and private and parochial schools, a math and science program. Mm -hmm. But the former center then educated and also with individuals from the Department of Education designed that, but that program was the impetus of the legislature because I introduced a piece of legislation that put aside monies for both District of St. Croix and St. Thomas to create a summer program in the math science and environmental science so that they could be able to attract students to this for As a matter of fact, the program implemented at St. Croix Educational Complex, the students had got a summer stipend mm -hmm. for attending us so that we have to find a way to pull our students into areas that we know that they need to be in order for us to exist and last as a community 
and to, to, to uh, what, what you all call it in energy, sustainable energy. <laughs> yeah, we, sustainable we, education. We want sustainable right. education. Let's go to Senator Bolquez. Senator, good evening. You're on the air. Hi, right, good evening. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you for calling in. What were your impressions of the governor's state of the territory this evening? Uh, well, uh, the governor started out um, sort of, you know, gloomy, but sort of came up on a higher pitch. Um, but what I believe is that we're feeling the impacts of the levelization of the federal funds that have been uh, throughout the territory. And of course, that coupled with inflation and the cost of living. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in order to balance that out. Uh, let me ask you something. The governor has spoken about money that's been obligated, allocated, et cetera. And these are mm -hmm. terms that uh, get thrown around. And the, the community in general sometimes doesn't grasp what th that all means. But when you hear the numbers that have been spent, what it says to me, uh, being a neutral observer or trying to be a neutral observer, is that there's a lot of money still to be spent that has not been obligated as yet. Um, did you hear tonight the things that you think would be necessary to get us on the ball to spend those funds? No, um, because I believe that the problem that we're facing right now are three problems. The government needs to enhance their collections. Uh, they need to augment the way that they uh, collect or upgrade the way that they do collections. They need to figure out a more streamlined procurement process so that the funds can be spent or allocated. Um, in a more timely way, and of course, the reconciliation of bank accounts and funds. We found out that our government has not been able to reconcile funds and bank accounts for quite some time. So if we're able to fix these three issues, I believe we'll start to see uh, a lot more progress in the sense of our economy. Senator, any last uh, and final points before we get to our, no our next caller? Uh, you know, um, the governor indicated a number of things. I, I, I would have liked him to um, speak a bit more about progress on St. John. He did mention the school, of course, um, and he mentioned the, the basketball court and the tennis court. But there's a lot of other issues that have been untouched on the island of St. John that require um, some attention. So I hope that his administration uh, adheres to that and are able to pay a bit more attention to some of the infrastructure needs of the island of St. John because it is... Uh, by, by capita, by GDP, we, we um, support the tourism product um, with, with just all around the year tourism um, attraction and, and just revenue generation. So um, we, really, we really need to make sure that the infrastructure of St. John gets the adequate attention that it needs. Well, thank you so much for joining our program, Senator Bolquez. We appreciate your call. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you. I'm going to go to, um, and I will come back to the panel. We have Senator Capehart, I believe, on the line. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, good evening. Senator Capehart, is that you? That is me. Thank you for joining the program. You're on live. What was your impression of what the governor said this evening? And give me the three areas that stood out the most for you. Um, the three areas that stood out to me, well, you know, I, I didn't know that the, the territory was going to be receiving a million dollars in opioid. Um, I think it's very important that we address these kind of epidemics that's, um, you know, nationally, that's affecting many people in the states that is trickling to the Virgin Islands. Um, so I'm happy to hear about that. I'm happy to hear that things are doing well in the tourism industry. Um, we have a new hotel that's coming on St. Croix, new hotel on St. Thomas. I'm happy about that. So the opiate, the opioid crisis assistance and tourism are two of the areas. Give me one more area that stood out for you this evening. Um, another area that stood out positively or? Just that you find most important. Well, education, um, education and crime. You know, he spoke, he did mention about my, my recent bill that was passed, um, and he signed it into law, which is the real-time crime center, um, which is, it helps give the police department the tools that they need. It's like the icing of cake of all the different technologies 
coming together in one. So I'm happy about that for the Virgin Islands Police Department. He mentioned about that, so I'm happy that he mentioned it so the territory could even hear about this. And education, um, there's a lot of school projects coming forward in 2024, um, and all the three islands, I'm happy about that. Um, so there are positive things that I took. You know, the horse track is coming um, in St. Thomas. I'm looking forward to uh, accountability on St. Croix with the, um, the IGL to make, as he said, make good commitments. So those are some of the things that stood out for me. Well, Senator, thank you for taking time out to join us here on the program on WTJX. Thank you for you having have a good me. Evening. All right, I'm going to come to you, the panel. Oh, we heard from Senator Bolquez and we heard from Senator Capehart. Let's start with your impressions on what was said. I think it's important when you were mentioning about allocated funds, obligated funds. I think the key word for the general public that we need to pay attention to is spent right now according to the last uh, hearing that we had on Friday, for example, they're saying we got $541 million in, in ARPA funding and they've obligated 438. What does that mean? Yeah. Obligated just means they have assigned out X amount to this agency or X amount to this project, but the money has not been spent. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the recovery. We have these billions of dollars. We know we're getting them in tranches. But what we have received so far, we haven't spent. And what I heard the governor talk about that he's looking to do regarding the recovery is he wants to get like the heavy lifters, the big guys from the states, maybe three or four of them to come in and bid on all of these huge projects. He wants to um, bundle them, if you will, mm -hmm. and give the big projects to these stateside companies. And mm -hmm. they're going to bring in the manpower, and they're going to be able to get this recovery going. And it goes back to what we were discussing here on the panel, where we knew from back in 2017 that we needed to start within our community to build a labor force, to train our people, to meet this demand today. So once again, here we are, where our young men and women are going to be really losing out on this opportunity because we have to now bring people in from the states to help us with our recovery. Um, Attorney St. John, your thoughts on what Senator Bolkes and Senator Capehart had to say this evening? Well, I think they, they made some very good points. Um, I like Senator Capehart's mention of her crime bill. I thought that the real-time crime uh, initiative uh, was important. Uh, one of the major things we need to improve as it relates to crime in the Virgin Islands is uh, statistics. Uh, we need to uh, be able to look and see what the results are. It's 2024. I don't know if anybody on the panel could tell us how many homicides we had in 2023. Um, if, you, if you can, that's great. But, we, you know, in other jurisdictions, you can get online. You can actually the see. The statistics are oh, there. Oh, man, it's by map. That. They'll map yeah. you this way. Robbery yep. here, robbery there. Yep. You know, we have a right to know. We're paying the police uh, department for services. We have a right to know things like this. So I, I like the, that initiative um, and all um, what Senator Capehart has done, and I'd like to see more movement um, to modernizing that. So her points on crime, I think, were prescient. Mr. Hodge? Yeah, I, I would say that the, the obligation part of the process is huge in, in federal um, uh, procurement. That's when you actually have the, the go-ahead to, to start to do the activity, to spend the money until it's obligated. They, don't, they haven't confirmed the project for you, or that they're going to fund it. Um, but a super PMO is what they're talking about. And a super, super PMO is going to have a billion dollar projects. So you're going to bundle projects together. You'll have a billion dollars worth of projects in certain parts of the islands. Uh, in St. Croix, you might take and lump three sectors and do all of the school uh, infrastructure and everything, totaling a billion or more in that area and get it done um, by large uh, entities with the involvement of some of the local companies. Ideally, what I want to see local small um, contractors get all the work, no doubt. But there's no way that we're going to get all the money spent if we, if we continue down that road at this point. So the super PMO is about the, the only way I see it, it feasible to get the, the 
12, 15 billion dollars spent right now in, in a timely manner that doesn't result, re result in us giving it back to the federal government. We're going to try and get some more feedback from our elective officials, but uh, quickly, uh, Senator Richards, what you just heard from Senators Capehart and Senator Bolquez, um, their response to the state of the t their territory, what, what are your thoughts? I was going to ask you if I, if I could just be, be nice and let you take Please be some, nice. some, some more calls from, from the Senators because I, I want to make a comment, particularly to, to those members of, um, I think sometimes they forget that they are a separate branch of government who are now off in the commentary. So I will yield. I, I will remind you that I did yield. Okay. <laughs> Caller, good evening. You're on the air. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, Richard is speaking right now. You're on the air, sir. Pleasant good evening. Yes. This is Dean Leonard from St. Thomas. Yes, and go ahead. I didn't hear anything about agriculture. And for our economy to grow, we have to be able to sustain ourselves in feeding ourselves. All, all our money goes back out in feeding ourselves. And without agriculture being addressed and produced, promoted, we, we're in a quandary. Okay. Well, thank you for that observation. And we mentioned that earlier on the panel. I believe uh, Delegate Plaskett is on the line attempting to get in. Let's see if I can connect her. Good evening, Delegate. You're on the air. Hi. Good evening. How are you all? Doing very well. A lot to digest in the state of the territory, but I'd like to ask you for your initial thoughts on what the governor delivered in his sixth state of the territory address. Sure. I, I can't believe I feel like a veteran in the room. I've been at like maybe quite a number of them now. Um, but uh, I'm grateful for, to, for the ability to serve the people and be there. I think one of the things that you have to give Albert Bryan is he is continually very resolute. He is very resolved about ideas and opportunities and his willingness to see the optimistic side of things and how things can be moved forward. I think that came across in this one as well. Um, and so I'm grateful to have a governor who does think like that. There were uh, some areas, of course, that I felt a sense of pride in myself and the work that our team has done particularly when so much of the discussion was around federal funding and work that over the years uh, my office has been really key in bringing, whether that be the disaster recovery funding or the ARPA funding during the pandemic, the COVID um, pandemic funding as well, HUD funding. I'm really grateful for that. Whether that came through the Wartsilla um, use of CDBG funds for the Wartsilla leases, um, as well as with the VTOL discussion, using CDBG mitigation funds there as well. And so in that respect, um, I think that we have huge opportunities here in the Virgin Islands. I will have to say when the governor talked about the $8 billion that's been obligated, we recognize, my office recognizes that of that $8 billion that's been obligated, only $3.1 billion has been utilized to date. Much of that was during the initial phase after the hurricanes with the emergency recovery and administrative costs. So of that obligated, mm -hmm. we still have five billion that is not actually on the ground. That's got to get there. And the governor talked about five, potentially 15 billion being used for whether it's our schools, whether it's to the hospitals, um, our roads, changing our sewer systems, et cetera. And many of us are aware that there will be a need for a 10% match, which comes to approximately $1.5 billion. Um, some time ago, I talked with the governor about changing his request from a complete waiver to waiving those things for critical infrastructure. And that would be our schools, our hospitals, police stations, things of that nature to make that ask of the administration because we recognize that the reason that administrations have a match is because they want to make sure that uh, the costs do not become unnecessary bloated, that people have something in the game that they're utilizing um, and, and so to hold them accountable to. 
So I think that one of the things that the governor talked about, which was really key, was a comprehensive long-term cash management strategy. I think that's something that will give the feds comfort that we're utilizing our funds appropriately. And it's something also the people of the Virgin Islands will be able to look at and see transparency in government. But of course, Leslie and your panelists know, it's all about the details of that. That's going to be the key and what's most important. Well, um, thank you so much for calling into the program and sharing that information. Some of the points that you mentioned, we've discussed here on the panel, and we'll continue mm -hmm. to discuss those um, after your call. But thank you for taking time out and joining the program. Sure. One of the things that you know the governor talked about was um, solar, the solar for all. Um, just reminding people that that's a competitive grant as well, mm. part of the competitive program. So. I'm crossing my fingers and hoping Kyle Fleming, I believe, wrote an amazing grant request. Our office really pushed forward and we're having discussions to make sure that he gets that full amount because um, that will be transformational. But there are other things that we're working on as well. Um, two weeks ago, the governor and I, a week ago, the governor and I sent a joint letter to the Secretary of Energy to Granholm to come to the Virgin Islands. I've had discussions as well with uh, the White House, with John Podesta, who's in charge of all of the Inflation Reduction Act. And listen, the president said that he wants to put this money for alternative energy, moving things to alternative energy in places that are underserved, underrepresented, are impacted by climate change, majority minority communities, and that's us all over. And the owners of Hovenza, of the refinery, ooh, let me watch me saying Hovenza, but <laughs> the new refinery of Port Hamilton have said that they are interested and recognize that fossil fuel refining cannot continue forever and that they're willing to work with the administration, work with us and developers and financiers to move that uh, facility into um, some other type of alternative energy um, project as well. And so we're all working together on that, and I'm hopeful that something's going to come out of there. Well, that's good news to hear. Thank you so much again for calling Thank in. You. And we're going to get to some other callers. I believe we have Senator Gittins on line three. Good evening, Senator. Thank you for joining the program. Hi, good evening. How are you? Welcome. You're on the air. Thank you. Good evening to the people of the Virgin Islands. And good evening to the uh, panelists there. Senator, uh, let me ask you, a litany of different issues were brought up. If you could give to us the three issues that stood out the most for you and you think would be the most impactful that was discussed this evening in the state of the territory, we'd like to hear that. Well, uh, for, first I want to say that the, uh, I do believe that the governor's speech was uh, uh, upbeat. Um, uh, however, uh, for me, I, I just thought that it lacked a couple of uh, timelines uh, with some initiatives that he spoke about, um, like with the roads, uh, the, um, the build of schools, our hospitals, and even with the, um, the, the WAPA project with, um, with the new generators and the renewable energy system. I would have just liked to know that, um, that we had a little uh, timeline uh, with that. I was also um, disappointed uh, well, from last week to know uh, why the retroactive monies weren't paid when the legislature actually appropriated $25 million uh, towards this and to have it done by December 31st, 2023 and to find out that only $2.5 million was used out of it and the other monies were spent elsewhere. Very interesting point that you bring up, um, but you had the governor's financial team before the legislature on Friday. Were those issues that you brought up with uh, our OMB director and the finance commissioner and the other representatives there? Well, uh, OMB, uh, I mean, the OMB director was there, yes, uh, ODR uh, wasn't, but yes, these uh, things were brought up. And what was the response from the team, just for the listening audience? Right, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, though, that um, this <laughs> evening's uh, address that was my only um, uh, drawback that it didn't um, have timelines okay all right um, anything else that stood out for you in this evening's address well uh, additionally um, I, I like the fact that we're, we're looking at um, addressing our abandoned and dilapidated uh, buildings in the downtown area and I just want to add that on January uh, 30th 
uh, I too have a bill coming forward uh, that will address the um, historic preservation in our downtown areas. And it's a two-pronged um, approach where we will ask that the Historic Preservation Commission uh, simply identify properties within our downtown areas that have significant his, uh, historic significance to it and allow for the other buildings or properties that are just simply old to be able to maintain the facade on the outside and, and to release them from that strict uh, preservation. So hopefully um, we could get some movement on this. Yes, like the governor said also, you know, this isn't just, um, uh, it's just not one thing that will address this problem because he also mentioned even the probate cases and whatnot. But let me ask you something real quickly. Um, have you reviewed the legislation that the governor sent down and how is your legislation different or enhances his uh, proposed legislation and is there a possibility that they may be combined? Because I understand that Senator Donna Fred Gregory also has a piece of legislation addressing the same issue. Right. I don't think that it'll be able to be combined. However, um, I have asked that um, we do um, have some more conversation on this to see how we could um, work things in to include um, Senator Fred Gregory, who has um, something as well. And I believe one other senator, I can't recall who it is. But if we could um, all come together and see if we could make it um, one approach, uh, we can do that. But the conservatorship is, is um, a real concern uh, to many. So I'm just looking at this um, closely. All right. Well, thank you, Senator Gittins, for giving us a call on WTJX. We appreciate you taking time this evening. And thank you all so much for bringing this forward to the people of the Virgin Islands and educating them as well. Thank you so much. Attorney Henry, your thoughts on what you heard from Delegate Plaskett and Senator Gittins? So with um, Senator Gittins, um, you were asking the question about the, the $25 million that the legislature um, set aside for the government to use for the retro pay. Mm -hmm. And according to the OMB director, um, only $2.5 million was spent for that purpose, and they said they had to use the $22.5 million to pay payroll. Mm -hmm. So that's where the money went. Pay, well, thanks for answering that because I'm sure people wanted to know. Yes. Um, and I think um, with the delegate, she brought up something that um, we have heard about for a very long time, but the issue still remains, which has to do with the matching to be, for us to be able to utilize this HUD funding and a lot of the, to move the um, recovery forward. That is something that has plagued us, even though we have on the one hand nine, 10, 11, 12 billion dollars, the federal government requires a match in certain instances and we just didn't have the funding and we still don't have the funding. So that remains an issue that we, we, we have to get resolved. Um, I, I definitely like the part of what she spoke about, the potential of the refinery being used for something other than refining because the, the world is moving away from fossil fuel, whether it's through what we're talking about here, renewable energy, um, efficient um, electrical cars. We're just moving away from fossil fuel because it's not a renewable source. It has an infinite um, uh, amount, and we recognize the, the, the environmental impact. So this is something that was being pursued before, so I'm happy to hear that this administration is looking into alternative um, for using that refinery space that it wouldn't wreak as much havoc in the environment and to the people of Sink. And Crucians, de Crucians deserve that, I think. Absolutely. Um, Senator Richards, have you had a chance to think creatively and outside the box about this 10% match that we're obligated to. And there's a lot of historic issues that have led us to this situation. A delegate mentioned about, you know, the federal government wanting to see accountability and us having skin in the game. But for, we have not been able to tackle this issue. Um, how do you see us and what could we do to get over this 10% matching fund hump that seems to be, uh, you know, the 500 pound gorilla in the room? And I apologize, I don't mean to be looking at you as if you're crazy, but 
I was doing that because I'm going to be short on, in response to your question and come back to retrieve my time about the senators and the commentary. And um, the commentary by Delegate Plaskett um, was right up the alley in regards to what I spoke about at the beginning of the program about prioritization of projects. And um, if you set priority, you could determine whether or not um, how much money you could get up in this particular fiscal year to meet the matching, or whether or not these prioritized projects can be meeting the request for a waiver. Yeah. So that is my, my quick response. And then um, I, I was getting ready to say, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunately, I had um, 12 years of catechism for uh, going to school. And, um, you know, cat is like kumbaya. <laughs> and in listening to, to the senators, um, from the first one that spoke right down to the last one that has spoken this, this evening, and it, um, it concerns me because the, the, the first statement was, um, I'm glad that I heard it. the governor said that we all work together and we all should get along and let's kumbaya. But it appears they don't understand the structure of the government that exists in the territory of the Virgin Islands. And one of the, the number one responsibility of members of that legislative body is checks and balance. Attorney Henry was just given the explanation that um, the legislature passed a law appropriating $25 million to pay retroactive salary increases. The executive branch, whether through OMB or finance, broke the law by taking more than 75 or 80 percent of the money and spending it for some other purpose. Actually, it does. They took 90 percent of it. Whatever it was. Yeah. Let's call it 90. You yeah, know, no, it is nine because if they took 2.5 out of 25, that's 10 percent. So 10 percent. See, I don't need them remedial courses at UVI. But so, go ahead. So whatever percentage of the money, the fact is that they broke, they broke the, law. the law. You're right. And then You're right. there is also a law, and this is going back to um, Attorney um, St. John. He made a point that it that is so important because when I work in a government which from um, 1977 to 1995 in the executive branch of government, departments were required to develop and submit to the legislature and publish to the general community an annual report. Like for health, you had the 10 leading causes of debt. Yes. And you had these kind, kind of things. The post auditor, which is a requirement by law for the legislature, is also supposed to give a report and accounting and a report to the members of the Finance Standing Committee and its membership for what any time where the executive branch failed to follow the financial and fiscal reporting and requirements of legislation passed as law. Mm -hmm. And here it is. They were told that Tony Henry heard them tell. I went down there to hear it live, but they didn't start on time on Friday morning. They were told that, well, we broke the law. So what are they going to do? What is the legislature going to do about enforcing the statutory responsibility of the legislative branch of government for check and balance and oversight of the budget of the Virgin Islands? This, this is what we're suffering from in my last commentary. Uh -huh, real quickly, because we have Senator Johnson on the line. I'd like to get to him. He'll be ready when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, <clears throat> my last commentary is, 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 is this, that... Um, the, the, the subject matter of um, let's work together, and, and, and it gives a bad public impression about the function of government. Here it is, the governor held a meeting in government house with only the democratic members of the majority to discuss the financial team, spitting in the face of non-democratic members of the legislature who are res representatives of you and I in the body. And you're speaking about um, working together and having respect as an institution. And none of them who didn't mind. Let me hear them making a nice about it or no? Right there in there, and I said that you meet with everybody else but me. You everybody in the public will know. Absolutely. You meet with, and that leaves a clear impression, is what he's saying. And that is why um, you haven't been here for the Calypso show, so you, you miss the song from um, Lady Mac. That is why the governor could say that he, in the interview, with the consortium that he expect to get whatever it is he want when he go before the legislature because this is how the institution is being run. As if it's a, it's a um, what do you call it, a whirlpool or a bathtub for any amount of water to be dumped on them. Mm 
Mm. And, We're and I'm sorry I didn't mean to speak at length, but I think I, I need to make those points, points clear. Yes. I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Hodge, but let's go to Senator Johnson. Senator Johnson, good evening. You're on the air. Hey, good evening. How are you doing? Thank you for calling in. Let's get your first impressions of the state of the territory this evening. And what are three areas that stood out for you most? Well, you know, the, the governor always talk on an upbeat, and that is way of doing things. I clearly think he was on a different page of music with his financial team. They say one thing to us last, last mm -hmm. week, and he's saying a whole different page. So that has great concern for me. There's a few things that really stood out to me that I really wanted to hear about. That Envision program with these homes that are being left in the condition that they're in from the hurricanes. That's number one. I spoke a little bit about the prison. I can teach you saying that every time we send our prison away, which we just sent about 22 of them away, we're investing in the next community. I didn't hear much about Polly Joseph or Lionel Roberts Stadium, which would be sports tourism that will generate a lot of money for us. And, and we're not pushing these projects. But those, those three things, and then our seniors, didn't hear nothing as if it doesn't exist. Our senior homes are closed, and we didn't have any conversation about them. And last, and I think I went past three, was the learn loss. What are we going to do to get these children put up to date with the learn loss? Well, thank you so much. I think uh, you highlighted some very critical areas. Let me ask you about items that the, the governor may have presented this evening that you thought were well executed or well done. Is that again? I didn't hear you. I said, let me ask you about areas that you think the governor presented this evening that you thought were satisfactory or well done or that you were happy to hear about. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm from the western part of the island. And I'm pleased to see that the Melvin Evans Highway is definitely getting taken care of. I have to drive that road every day. But that for sure I'm happy to see because for years now we're going with the highway not being lit. Most of it is already lit, and I can see progress on that road. I see progress when it comes to the water line, but I still believe that they should have started from the next end of the island. But there's progress with the water line being buried all through Camp Rico. I saw some progress on some of the roads that are in bad condition. So those areas I'm a little pleased with, but there's always more room for improvement. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Senator Johnson, for calling in. Are you still there? Yes, I am. I am. We appreciate you um, spending your time and shedding light on things that you thought the governor should have addressed and things that he did that you were um, satisfied with. Thank you so much for tuning into the program and giving us a call this evening. Happy New Year to all of you guys on the panel. Happy thank New you. New um, Mr. Hodge, yes. uh, let's, let's go back to the comments from Senator Gittins, um, Delegate Plaskett, and, the, and now commentary we got from Senator Frankie Johnson. What, what are your thoughts on what they had to say? As I, as I dive into it, I, I chuckle when I hear anyone make it seem like this administration has been anything close to rubber stamp from this legislature because it's not been that kind of party. They, they have not had a... a a great relationship for the entirety of his time there. And it's been indicative in all the major initiatives. I usually say that every legislature, which is every two years, has a major initiative that they come in front of them. And none of them have went smooth. None of them have gone for how the course was designed or, or, or to take place. And they've all been really bumpy roads. I haven't seen any rubber stamping or anything close to that nature taking place. But the Envision program that was mentioned by this Senator and, and a I think couple other uh, callers, callers yeah. is, is, is one that, you know, we have, we have programs that are, that are modeled from things that took place in the States, and, and they're a little different here in, in our territory. This is the one where you have, I think, $350,000 for the repair of homes from the hurricane. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, what, what has to happen if with each home individually here, you have to get a structural engineer, you have to get a, a, a design for that home. It's not like we have... 400 homes that are all the same, so we make the design and we're going to do one cookie, cookie cutter and, and fix all of them. Each home, design, structural engineer, fund, and move on. So it's a very lengthy process, unfortunately, by, by, the, by the nature of it. So, but let me ask you something real quick. A very lengthy process. We're here at now a very lengthy seven, six and a half years, going on seven years since the storm. 
How have we not been able to figure this out in all? But the I time? don't think the envision program was around for the entire six. It years. started in Kenneth Map's administration. Right, the, but the program, I think, the, the implementation of it didn't take place until afterwards. Well, I know that in the Map administration, there was some misallocation of funds on. Uh, well, let me not say that. People had questions about funding that was spent on marketing to the program, vehicles for the program before the first roof even got put on. Uh, case, and so I point. think uh, look, the Fed's looking back at us. If we're spending money on um, four-wheel drive Jeeps and, and advertising but not putting roofs on homes, you can still fly over St. Croix, fly over St. Thomas and St. John and see blue tarps still on people's house. Sometimes every time it rains, I think, oh, my God, there's people still out there living in a portion of their homes. This is one of those low-hanging fruits that we were talking about earlier that you get this done, people gonna feel good. I mean, a roof on your home, we all know if your roof goes during a storm, that's it. That's your first line of defense yeah. and the most important line of defense. Right. You, some water could come in, but as long as I got a roof on my arm, we could sweep that water out and keep it moving. Um, when that doesn't happen, you know, people lose confidence in our ability to get things done. And I hear what you're saying, Hugo. Yes, these things can be made complicated, but by God, six and a half years, and it seems like, what do we say to these people that have been, every time it rain, got to mop up, or a bed get wet, or they lose appliances and have to go to go buy a new stove or a new fridge because something get wet that, you know, what do you tell those people? I mean, I don't know if the complexity of things is, is holding water right now with folks, and I think, um, that's why we have people calling in and asking about these things right now. I need to get to um, Senator uh, Francis Heiliger. Senator Francis Heiliger, you're on the air. Hi, good evening, good evening, everyone. Good evening. We were just talking about members of the legislature that are in the minority, and you are in the minority, and discussions held with the governor and his financial team, which you and others in the minority in the legislature were not invited to the table to speak. How do you feel about that, and, and, and what did you think about what the governor had to say this evening, particularly uh, since the governor's financial team was before the body just last Friday? Well, I am not sure about not being invited. I guess if you don't know, you don't know. But one of the things that I recognize is that... So wait, I just want for a clarification. Put out and just there were several bits of revelation that took place at that hearing on Friday. I was encouraging the public to tune in because the governor was advocating and requesting a line of credit that in order for them to continue to balance how they're spending and getting access to cash when revenues are coming in. Initially last week when the message was being put out to the public, um, it was being shared that the numbers were way below from what we had received in the previous year. Um, some 179, and then it got, um, we were at 150, and then at the hearing it was changed to 171. But my concern with how we were looking at the numbers, if you were to do the math, if IRB said they brought in 174, if property taxes brought in 8.3, we heard this evening that DPNR and their fines, I mean, dealing with their permit process brought in another set of millions of dollars. Um, I, I was confused as to how we are getting all of this money, but still having an issue with how we are spending. Yeah. And I do agree with the governor, a lot of our issues is a management problem. And the fact that there was over 70 plus million dollars that we could have accessed, that we're having a difficult time drawing down, part of the problem in our government is people are not being held accountable for not doing their job. Well, let me ask something, and just to clarify, you're saying if you didn't know earlier in terms of that meeting with the financial team and the governor, to, with the, the meeting with the legislature to discuss the finances, you're saying that you weren't told at all? No, no, no. W which meeting? I have no, I, you said the minority was not invited. That's what I think I heard you say. Yes. Yeah, well, I... If we were not invited, I wouldn't have known about it. I, you just, I, just, want, I just wanted clarification. It was discussed oh, okay. here on the, the well, panel I, earlier. I find it ironic because being the author of the piece of legislation to alter um, the line of credit in order to give the governor um, this access to $50 million, I think it would have been prudent if he didn't discuss it with the individuals that's fighting really hard to understand this. Because... 
when you're telling me we're not making money, but then I'm hearing the numbers coming in different at the hearing, but then I'm supposed to just come forward, no questions asked, just offer a piece of legislation to give you access to $50 million, upwards to $50 million, and you're not having any discussion with me who actually holds authorship to that piece of legislation. I just think it's not working together. And as much as he said that he would like to work together with this institution and some of the members, I, I don't always see that happening. Well, I certainly appreciate that um, perspective. And is there anything else you'd like to add before you jump off the air? Well, um, I, I really would have liked to see the governor speak a little bit more dealing with our children. I think that aspect of it where you have the report of kick count that came out that said that 33% of our children here in this territory are living in poverty, that is the state of our territory. And when we have situations that we're not really focusing on addressing those things where it was never even discussed, I see that as a major problem. Dealing with our educational system, uh, we never heard anything about seniors. So a, a lot of things like this, I, was, I, I felt a little bit disconnected from the speech, but at the end of the day, I like to look forward. And hopefully through discussion and dialogue, we could work a little bit closer to make sure that we do what's best in the interest of the people of this territory. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and giving us a call here on WTJX. We appreciate your call. Um, have a blessed day. So we hear, we're hearing the same things from different, and I know they Sorry. didn't coordinate tonight. So when you hear that, what do you think? Let me come to you, Attorney St. John. When you hear the same things coming from um, different senators, you know, seniors, education, what would your advice be to the governor this evening? Well, I would say, um, you know, I, th I think the governor has tried to develop a cordial relationship. I would agree that um, they have not just been rubber stamping. Um, if, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the marijuana bill took several tries. The land swap bill took several tries. I don't think this has been a rubber stamp legislature. Uh, legislature. Uh, but I would say um, to the point that about checks and balances, this is a structural problem. When you look at our organic act and you read that document, there's no way a political science nerd or a constitutional law nerd would be able to look at that document and say that that was ever intended to be a separation of powers structure. Um, for example, the legislature lacks, what is the greatest check the legislature has against the executive? The impeachment power. The legislature, the Virgin Islands, lacks any impeachment power against any executive official. They don't have impeachment power against judges. I mean, it's insane. You read that document, there's no separation of powers. It never was intended to be that way. And we, we do need to change that. But well, members of the legislature can recall any elected official with a um, three-quarters vote. in the, So they can impeach the governor, lieutenant governor, at any time. Now, uh, we normally take that step, or a member of the body, as they have in the past, um, we normally take that step very quite seriously, but if you read the Organic Act, there's actually a legislative way to remove elected officials and a way of, of recall that is by petition that can be orchestrated by citizens. I, I thought the, the, the two-thirds had to go to a vote. Of, yeah, a of, vote of, of the legis Of the public. No, be confirmed. no. Okay. What the law states in the Organic Act is that if the individuals that organize a recall, they have to collect signatures um, of, I think, 75%, I might be off on a percentage, but it's a percentage of the votes, the whole number of votes cast for that particular office. So you could sit down and you know do the math on what it would be per election, and those amount of um, signatures are required. But in the Organic Act, recall removal by the legislature is the first item that's listed, and then recall by citizen petition. So then there's there, there are recourse. There's a recourse. I'm not saying they should do it. But if it exists in the Organic Act, then there's a recourse. And it's, that's just a legislative decision not to pursue um, recourse. Mr. Hodge. Let me just say for the record, checks and balance and adversarial aren't synonyms. Yeah. They're not. So that's, that's not make it sound like to give checks and balances have to be adversarial to you and we have to be at war. That's not how it works. When you say work together, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm just going to co-sign everything you bring and assume the debt. It means that we're going to take through this process of having checks and balances, we're gonna find something that works for the benefit of the people, the ones that we all are elected to serve. I mean, I, when I hear the, the commentary about breaking the law um, with, with making payroll, okay, the, 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 law, the law was passed as such, what are we saying? 
let's arrest him for making payroll and, and, and paying the, um, the, the, the other wages a little bit later down the line. I mean, we, we, what, what does that do to the economy to miss payroll? We, what, what does it do to, the, to the, all the government workers out there? It doesn't make sense. Let's make sense of it, right? If we have $25 million, we're at risk of missing payroll. Mm -hmm. We pay some of the retro. We pay the payroll. We're going to get more funds coming in. We're going to pay the retro. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I, can't, I can't advocate to say I'm not going to make payroll. I'm just going to pay all the retro and let the a pay less pay to take place. Sure, but then you begin a slippery <clears throat> slope of unaccountability uh, of of in essentially doing what you want and so I respectfully it, it, disagree I don't think that. I don't think what Senator Richards was in, I, I, implying I, I, I was I, I'm trying to make clear what it is I'm okay saying. I don't think he was saying let's arrest the governor um, we, or remove even remove the governor we say, but we, we have, have to ask we have there. to ask for accountability because where does it stop I saw that you had a point you wanted to make real quickly. And as one, the old second lady on the panel, I, I'd like to let you get in here. No, I, I, I think the issue of the accountability is important because I know, again, during the hearing, one of the things that the OMB director was emphasizing was that the legislature passes a balanced budget. And after they pass the budget, basically, what happens along the way in their business because they pass a, a, a balanced budget. The legislature is not supposed to go and um, try to appropriate or, or spend any other funding to meet any other community needs because there's a balanced budget that has been spent. And I think that that is false. And when you look at this same issue we're talking about with the $25 million, I think that knowing that it's a line item, it's specifically for this use the administration had a responsibility to at least notify the legislature, we are in this position, this is what we are wanting to do with the money, at least that, not after the fact, coming down, telling them like it's none of, it's none of their concern, and then when you ask, so how are you now going to pay the retro? Oh, well, we're going to pay 2.5 million every pay period, and then, OMB director say, oh, no, no, that's not the plan because that would take 10 months. So even among the financial team, there was not even a concrete understanding as to how they're going to meet this obligation that the money was already put there to meet. Very it's salient point. We only got five minutes left, so let's get this caller in real quickly. Caller, good evening. You're on the air. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. We only have five minutes left. All right. Go ahead with your questions, ma'am, or comment. All right. Uh, good evening, uh, all. I appreciate your panel. I have, uh, well, it was touch on vocational schools. Um, I think that these uh, vocational training would serve our community very well. Uh, I saw a lot of Puerto Ricans, a lot of uh, people from Dominican Republic after uh, the big storms, the twin storms in 2017, uh, building and repairing and the like. Now, if we beef up our vocational schools, we can have our population here uh, attending to uh, and building up our community and building new uh, uh, uh. are you still there caller yes i am okay or have you uh could you wrap up your comments because we're just about to sign off okay i also have another comment about homeless people okay. mental illnesses and uh, services for disabled persons, whether you are okay. blind or otherwise, and all encompassed facility with nurses, etc., and educational, like in Braille, etc. Well, thank you so much for your call. I appreciate that. Folks, I'm going to give you 
30 seconds each and I'm running my timer. Final thoughts, <laughs> Senator Richards, because we got to stay tight on our schedule. Go ahead. I believe both um, Attorney St. John and Mr. Hodge, well, he did say he's an engineer. I said so. <laughs> yeah, you did state earlier that that was your field of study. Um, I had, not only do I have an understanding of the legislature, I've been a lawmaker for 10 and work as a researcher for another 10 years in the legislature. And when we speak to the, the subject matter. Real quickly. I understand the time, but it's important because the listening audience and the viewing audience are being misled by the, the subject matter of um, accountability, checks and balance. In section title, title two, title two chapter 10, mm -hmm. section 203, speaks to the acts of public officers of m malfeasance, misfeasance. And it's not whether or not you could arrest them, it's that they're statutory. There's a law that requires them to do as required. And my last comment, Real quickly. If, if they wanted to change the use of the money, it, it is incumbent upon them to come back to the legislature to get approval and authorization for reprogramming money right. already appropriated. I'm going to let you have that final word. You take up everybody's time by getting wrought up in my ears. So well, we understand that. that. But I love you for making that point because it's a very and people salient are listening. one. I don't want them it to has truly been a pleasure sharing this evening with our power panel here in the studio and with you, the listeners and viewers at home. On behalf of all of us here at WTJX, I'm Leslie Camision. Good night. The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of WTJX, its board, staff, or underwriters. This program was underwritten in part by... VI Slice Moderate Income Homeownership Program helps eligible USCI residents buy or build their first home. Check eligibility requirements and a list of participating lenders at vislice.com. Your dream home awaits. And viewers like you.